Dear colleagues and friends, welcome to the SSAI webinar on COVID-19. This is a symbolic move. From this moment, June 16 at 12 noon, wearing our face masks in shops, buses, and crowded places is no longer mandatory in Oslo, but it's been mandatory since October. Things are getting better. But as we all know, the only thing we really know about the virus for sure is that we are unsure. On this day, 16th of June, the hotel that I'm in, the hub, was supposed to be filled with 1,200 participants in the SSAI biennial conference with the theme Monitoring Life. Today, we are six people working here. Um, Today, we're six people working on the webinar. This is a strong symbol what happened during the last 18 months. The world has experienced um, a health and economical threat that is the worst since World War II. Out of an outbreak in Wuhan, China, the coronavirus had got a new family member, the SARS-CoV-2. Despite the brutal lockdown in Wuhan, the virus spread to neighboring countries and to the rest of the world as opposed to the SARS-CoV-1 and the Ebola viruses with high mortality rates. The SARS-CoV-2 has fairly low morbidity and mortality rates, enabling it to spread to people with non and mild symptoms affecting those in the population that is vulnerable to this devastating effect of the virus. As of today, the mortality approaches 4 million people Number of cases is more than 175 million, and there are 10 to 20,000 people dying every day. The virus thrives among the poor, immigrant, and with limited resources and decreased ability to get the right information um, in time to take preventive measures. The virus is unevenly spread in different countries due to many factors such as population, density, economy, the handling of the disease by the health authorities, the trust in the politicians by the people, and many other factors. Health personnel like ourselves have been strongly challenged. We have lost some of our colleagues. Others have been severely ill but recovers. Others have had milder disease, but nevertheless have been victims of long COVID and have still not recovered. In a situation where most countries did not have storage of protective control equipment, lack of ventilators and lack of qualified intensive care personnel, the need for ad hoc solutions were urgent. Due to overflow of COVID-19 patients in hospitals, uh, other health Care personnel had a crash course in intensive care medicine and cohort care. But you do not learn the complexity of intensive care medicine in crash courses. It is far better than nothing, but caretaking by underqualified personnel most likely have contributed to the higher morbidity and mortality. On the positive side is the amazing development of vaccines with brand new technology. It is so new that if the pandemic had occurred two years earlier, it would not have been possible to develop the vac vaccines so fast. There are many players and some vaccines are effective, but with rare and serious side effects. As of today, 2.3 billion doses have been administered, far from enough but with much higher number than any other vaccine and with the efficacy is more than 95%, which is extraordinary. Mortality is rapidly decreasing due to the vaccine despite high numbers of infected people. But we put information on our webinar on the SSAI Facebook group and immediately we got several comments highly promoting vaccine skepticism. Fortunately, the vast majority accept vaccines, and this number has increased during the pandemic and is the most important weapon we have to fight the pandemic. And now you can start the presentation. We will look into the future and into the next Congress. First, so this is where the Congress is taking place. Uh, this is the Hub uh, Hotel. 
and it's the largest hotel in Oslo and can have 1,200 participants. Uh, we have called the original conference Monitoring uh, Life, and this was the first ad, but we had to postpone the conference, and now we are in the 2022. So we are 356 days away from the conference. Uh, we have chosen a monitoring uh, life, and that is a wide, um, it doesn't mean monitoring like pathophysiology, but monitoring means uh, uh, supervision, it means uh, diagnosis, it means taking care of the patients, taking care of the whole patient, and it is a broad program. So there will be an early morning start with a, a cultural event, uh, plenary lectures from 9 to 10.30, and uh, there will be six parallel sessions. Um, there will be simulation room, debates, virtual reality, sessions for short presentations, and interactive sessions. Uh, and um, start uh, Tuesday afternoon with all the uh, advanced educational programs uh, coming together at lunch and having programs for that day and, uh, uh, and end up with the common dinner. And there will be sessions for nurses and pandemics and uh, many rooms uh, for smaller uh, groups. Check out the web page. And now it seems that uh, we have a hang to get to the next picture here. Oh, there we go. Okay, so some themes. We have the common sepsis, ARDS, opioid free anesthesia, ethics with CDCD, uh, machine learning. Um, we have uh, research methodology, immune suppression, when things go wrong, mental health, burnout, suicide, developing countries, uh, the intox update, uh, Cannabinoids, opioid epidemic outcome in the IC stay, patient safety, PROMS, clinical research, organ monitoring, green session, ultrasound, therapeutic drug monitoring, education, and of course also some uh, COVID. There will be social events, welcome gathering in the city hall with the mayor, uh, dinner and show on Thursday evening at uh, the hub, and uh, there will be outdoor events like Fjord Cruise with dinner and entertainment, Marka Walk, that is uh, in the area surrounding Oslo, morning uh, runs and bath for those that want to do things like that. So, welcome to the 2022 uh, Congress. And as they say in every Apple event, registration is starting today. So, <laughs> welcome, and um, we are looking forward to it. Um, spread the news to everybody that you work with and uh, promote the Congress uh, so that it can be... I think that next year there will be a thirst and hunger for having a Congress that is a physical Congress where we uh, can meet. Um, we have now set together a uh, webinar, uh, and we are starting the program uh, now uh, with sessions for experiences, how we have had experiences in the different countries. We will have sessions on, um, on uh, treatment and, uh, uh, treatment and uh, science, and there will also be a session at the end where we will discuss the different uh, um, ways to prevent, uh, we have lessons learned to prevent uh, the next pandemic and do better the next time. So this was the 10 minutes for the opening uh, session and we now start the next um, session. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Stefan uh, Christensen. Uh, Stefan uh, is a, an MD, PhD at the Department of Intensive Care Medicine, Aarhus University Hospital. Um, his activities are focused on research based on clinical databases and administrative registries within intensive care. 
He's the chairman of the Danish Intensive Care Database and member of the steering committee in the EIP-1 multicenter European study uh, and member of the steering committee of also other multicenter studies, including the COVID steroid multicenter study. Espen, no, or Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sorry, there, there was a, a big problem. I, I didn't know when to start. So, uh, but I think now we are ready to go on. Uh, so the task for me was to present the experiences with handling COVID-19 patients in, in the ICU uh, in Denmark, where I'm from. And, and, uh, I've, I've done most of the data on this uh, together with uh, Nikolai Hose from, from Rift Hospital in Copenhagen, who really did a lot of the, the data handling uh, that on, on the things that I'll, I'll present today. Uh, just a few conflicts of interest. I'm chair of the Danish Intensive Care Database. I don't think that would be any uh, mean anything to the, the things that I'll present today. And I've been a member of the management committee for the Danish COVID-19 ICU database, which I'll present later on. So, so in, in Denmark, what is uh, important maybe to know is that the, there is a quality improvement database that is monitoring the quality of intensive care in Denmark called the Danish Intensive Care Database, DID. Um, it's based on a administrative registry, the National Registry of Patients. Um, it's just updated monthly. Uh, every tenth in every month, data are transferred from the National Registry of Patients to the database. Uh, unfortunately, the database underwent major changes in 2018 to, to 2020. There's a new data infrastructure in two of the five Danish regions. There was a, an update on the, day, on the National Register of Patients. Everything came together around the January uh, 2020. Uh, and that obviously meant that uh, our ability to see what was going on uh, regarding uh, the first surge of the COVID-19 patients were, were rather uh, difficult. Uh, so so back in, in March, we had no real-time data in Denmark on the ICU capacity uh, on the number of COVID-19 patients coming into our units and the treatment and, and the outcomes. Um, and, and this was the main struggle and it was just a, a very bad coincidence uh, between uh, changes in the data infrastructure and, uh, and the timing of the COVID-19. So a small group of, of patients, of, of people with uh, Nikolai Hose and uh, Anas Perna from uh, this hospital in Copenhagen in front uh, took up the task to collect manually uh, after screening all patients admitted to a Danish ICU uh, and, and getting data from the patient files uh, manually. And these data could then be updated daily or almost daily uh, and reports were published every, every two weeks. Um, so these data has previously been described in a paper in, in ACTA that came out in August uh, last year. Uh, with a number of, of analysis on, on the patients from Denmark in, during the first surge of, of COVID-19. Just a, a few things that uh, I would, uh, I was, the, the task was also to, to say something about the number of patients and the orange curve here is the total number of patients with COVID-19 admitted to Danish ICUs around almost 1400 uh, by now. Uh, it's the, the steep parts are obviously in March last year, and then again in January uh, this year. Um, the blue line, the blue uh, lines are, are the number of daily new admittance to the ICUs, again peaking in March last year and uh, in uh, January uh, this year. Um, this is from the paper in ACTA last year, uh, and uh, I can, I can the, the overall picture has not changed much uh, since then. At that time, we only had uh, around 320 patients admitted. Most of them were male, almost 70 years of age in average, a BMI of 27. Um, and what has also been described in, in other cohorts, uh, hypertension, chronic pulmonary disease, and diabetes as the most uh, common comorbidities. But also, I think quite importantly, about one third of patients had uh, 
no comorbidities, comorbidities at all registered. And this was done by manually going through the files. So it was a very thorough search for, for comorbidities. Um, updated data, almost 1400 patients now. Uh, that is 9% of all patients hospitalized with COVID-19 COVID in Denmark were, were admitted to the ICU. In the beginning, uh, during the first surge in, in March last year, the number was around 20% going down to, to this year, around 5% of all patients. As you can see uh, from during the first surge in March, April, May last year, about 80% were uh, mechanically ventilated, going down to 60% uh, during the second surge. I think this is the picture that, that we've seen in most international cohorts on, on COVID patients. Uh, days on mechanical ventilation around 13, not changed much. Uh, from the two periods. Um, number of patients on renal replacement therapy went down from 26% in the first surge to now 13%. Uh, and also the, the number of patients on, or the, the proportion of patients on ECMO uh, went uh, down. Uh, just to give you an impression of the mortality of patients in Danish uh, ICUs, um, Overall mortality, 38%, that's the, the red line. Uh, and obviously has been seen before and not surprisingly, uh, huge differences in mortality between uh, age groups. Um, the next thing that would be interesting is to see how the Danish ICU society coped with these uh, surges. And, and these are data from the Danish intensive care database on um, some of the variables that may describe if the patients, if, if the departments were overwhelmed by, by the number of patients. Uh, and generally, we can see that there were no more readmissions within to the ICU within 48 hours uh, than usually. Uh, the discharge during night uh, times were, were the same, uh, and transfers for non medical or capacity reasons from one ICU to another was the same uh, or at the, the level that, that we usually see in Denmark. So on the overall picture, it seems that there's been, we, we've been able to, to cope with the number of patients, uh, but obviously there has been in some departments and in shorter periods of time, there's been uh, uh, problems in, with the capacity also in, in Denmark. Uh, but the general picture has been that that the capacity seems to have been uh, high enough to cope with this, the surges of COVID-19 patients. Um, some of the things, just briefly on some of the things we learned, we'll, we'll hear about treatment modalities and things uh, later on in, in later sessions. But I think what we really learned uh, in, in the overall picture was the collaboration between societies, the Danish Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care the biochemistry and also the, uh, the Society of Infectious Diseases. Uh, and that therefore in, in March and April last year, the first national guidelines on treatment on COVID-19 came out based on international guidelines and, and studies. Uh, and I think the transmission of new knowledge to, into the clinical world has been very far to, fast. The, the translation has just been been uh, really impressive and uh, most of the larger trials they haven't even been published before they were the data were uh, put into the guidelines and and the the treatment strategies uh, around the the ICUs uh, was changed so i think this is uh, one of the things that we've uh, that we've learned and i think that we can build on from now on even in days without covid-19 so just to conclude this uh, 10 minute this, this short talk, uh, uh, for us, it was important to have daily, weekly data on ICU capacity, the number of new admissions and the need for organ support, which we didn't have at the time when, when the first patients were admitted. Um, generally spoken, the overall Danish ICU capacity was high or high enough to cope with the, this, both the first and, and the second uh, surge. But, but uh, obviously, uh, some departments at in, in shorter time periods have been 
um, have, have, have had a lot of patients and, and been very busy. Uh, Danish ICU patients, when compared to international cohorts, were slightly older and had more comorbidities. It may have been one reason could could be the data that we collected, the way that we collected the data. Um, uh, still, mortality was not increased among the ICU patients that we've been treating. Um, generally speaking, the respiratory support changed during the pandemic. Fewer patients on invasive from mechanical ventilation, more proning, uh, even awake proning. It's a change in anticoagulation treatment uh, based on, on the guidelines. So, so a lot of the, the medical treatment was, was changed, that changed as well. But I think uh, this will be covered in, in, in the, the sessions uh, in the next hours. Thank you very much. Much, Stefan, and apologies for our technical difficulties. Uh, we'll try to get that sorted. Just when you think you've got this uh, Zoom stuff down, new problems. Um, so our plan for this session is just to have short presentations back to back, and then we'll take some questions and see if we have time for some discussion at the end. So if you have questions or comments, please just leave those in the chat and we'll be watching that. Uh, and then I think we just need to rush to our next speaker, which is uh, Tero Varpula. Uh, he's the head of the perioperative intensive care and pain medicine at the hospital district of Helsinki and Usima, and will give us the Finnish experience. So please, if you could just uh, unmute and start your presentation when you're ready. Tero. Okay, yes, I'm ready. You probably hear me all right. Okay, yes, thank you for the organization, the opportunity to present our Finnish experience. And, and if I start very briefly, I would say that, uh, that in, in Finland, the, the pandemic has been moderate. Uh, they, they might, I, I don't go into details about the maybe political or epidemiological reasons for that, but, but the overall pandemic has been moderate in Finland and also the kind of the pressure for the uh, healthcare organization and, and for the ICUs has been moderate. During the last summer, the peak of the patients in the ICU was actually only 64 and and if we have kind of horrified look the numbers from our neighbors in Sweden so we have to say that we have been lucky but uh, what's the reason I just pick up one reason I just recently pick up the information that the strong recommendation to work at home has actually been uh, been took very seriously in Finland and the number of people working at home is probably highest in Europe. It said that 25% of the people has been uh, doing their work at home and that, that might be one reason that our numbers has been so moderate. But uh, I very briefly also share some information about our data collection when the pandemic started, we had a very new and very young government, but luckily we have a old and experienced uh, doctors in the Ministry of uh, Social Affairs and, and Health, and, and they already had a strong, uh, what they call strategy group, and they asked heads of the hospital districts and also in the very beginning of this pandemic, they consulted also intensivists, and I think we had a quite big role to uh, the form guidelines and, and also political measures, how to limit and, and what kind of uh, measures to limit the pandemic has been, uh, uh, I would say intensivists, we have been quite involved in this process. Of course, we were horrified also for the uh, King's College type of uh, prospective uh, epidemiological data and 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 we in the beginning of the pandemic we said that we don't have resources to respond to that kind of figures and 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 ministry of health gave very early in the pandemic for the hospital districts to double up the icu capacity uh, probably usually by measures to uh, shutting down elective surgery and 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 to build up temporary icus uh, we also in Finland, we have a quality registry uh, actually has been ongoing over 20 years now and, and that formed our basis for the data collection. 
Uh, also, our quality registry is not quite online. The data is picked up from the PDMs at the discharge of the patient. But uh, when we kind of build up in the early phases of the pandemic, our data collection, the Finnish Institute for well Health and Welfare, they give us kind of authorization to uh to take also the patient's social social security id to, to our data collection and 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 data set and that uh, actually allows us to follow up the patient's outcome and also we add kind of online uh, separate data collection to our data set which was updated kind of online and at least daily and 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 that form allowed us to take kind of very good online registry of the situation which we could share with the hospital districts districts and also the, the institute of health and welfare we also at the early phase of this this uh, havoc we organized organized what we call office coordinating intensive care and, and that was built up in the Kuopio uh, University Hospital's resources. And, and they uh, added also for our quality registry data set another queries, which was actually done with the mobile SACAP queries. And, and the, the main issue was to kind of find out what kind of resources in each hospital were av available at a daily basis. And, and altogether, these data items and data collections allowed us to build up quite nice dashboards, which we have also seen all over the world. But I think uh, before this pandemic, we didn't have anything like th this, but uh, now, now we really do. And, and we can very clearly and with various kind of... Uh, uh, angles to see the situation ongoing on uh, IC resources and, and what's going with the uh, epidemia overall. Uh, if we very briefly look at the patients, uh, patients, uh, the pandemic was very unevenly distributed in Finland. So the main proportion of the patients were in the southern part of Finland and the, at the capital region of Helsinki and, and, and the rest of the university districts was quite evenly distributed, but the number of the patients was, was very moderate in actually in each phases of, the, of, the, of this epidemic. Uh, here we can see a kind of a timeline of the resource, resource consumption of the ICUs, and you can see the uh, the overall number of the uh, COVID patients didn't exceed uh, over. I think the most most number was the 64, and we have a. Uh, if you look at the all country, we could see that there were available ICU beds. Uh, we don't have kind of any tr trouble during during last year, but as I said, it was very unevenly distributed, and and the Helsinki area ICUs we concentrated these patients to Helsinki and Jorvi hospitals, and and in these ICUs uh, we were quite uh, under heavy burden, and and actually during during this last spring we transferred 40 patients to other hospital districts due to resource resources and and due to lack of the available ICU beds. Uh, distribution of age is very similar as reported in the other cohorts, especially in the Nordic countries. Uh, I think there was slight change over the time. This is this is uh, during the first phase. Uh, I, I think the uh, main main proportion of the patients were middle aged and and we were uh, quite strict to uh, admit elderly patients. But that changed a little bit over the time. But still, if you look at the overall distribution of age, the uh, average age is around 60 years, so quite old. And as in Norway, uh, over 40% of the patients had no com chronic comorbidities uh, reported. Uh, the uh, treatment model this we used uh, as well, there was a slight change during the uh, pandemic. Uh, First of all, we, as everybody else, we used a lot of approach to 
proceed to invasive ventilation and intubation at the start of the respiratory failure, but uh, more and more uh, non-invasive ventilation was was used. Uh, I, I think we used also quite a lot of prone position, and uh, as I compared to Danish colleagues, the employment of renal replacement therapy was 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 much more less than in in Denmark. Uh, length of stay also differed slightly over the time, but but the, uh, as everywhere else in the world, the average length of stay was very low, and and the range of the length of stay was very wide. I think we have some patients staying at the ICUs over 100 days, so so there were some very very long uh, ICU stays. Uh, mortality uh, also in our, our cohort uh, changed a lot to, according to patient age. The overall mortality, I think, was very moderate. It's, it was only, only 13%. And, and also our experience did that the uh, mortality after discharge from the ICU remained quite moderate. So, so it, it will be very interesting to see the long-term mortality, one-year mortality, and also beyond that. Uh, I think one of the reasons for the quite low number of, uh, quite low mortality is our admission policy. Uh, of course, we knew, or we knew and generally that uh, mortality is highly dependent on patient's age. And I think we followed quite strict admission policy because we were at the beginning of the pandemic, at, at least we were very afraid that our resources would not allow the treat uh, kind of uh, hopeless patients. But uh, as you can see, the mortality is weighted to the elderly people. So this is the summary summary of our patients. Uh, one pickup is also the employment of ECMO that was uh, used only for six patients, I, I think this is below, uh, well below 1%. And, and, and as you can see, we had slight over 1,000 patients at the moment in our COVID cohort. So uh, the last pickup, I would say that the, uh, because the lockdown measures and, and, and at least last spring, we had a, a kind of very strong hold of the elective surgery and accordingly that uh, influenced our number of patients in the critical care. So uh, quite surprisingly, the number of patients admitted to ICU and also the uh, cumulative number of the care days was actually lower during this pandemic area than it was year time period year before. So this is very briefly our Finnish experience. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations. And we uh, move to the next presenter. That is uh, Martin Inge Sigurdsson from Iceland. Uh, he is working at the Landspital uh, in Reykjavik. And he started his uh, research uh, down on the basic level with DNA methylation. But he has uh, uh, taken the um, anesthesiology and the intensive care way. And he is now a professor of anesthesiology and intensive care at Landspital. And uh, uh, he will present the data from uh, Finland. Martin, are you ready? Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you for the, having the opportunity to join on this excellent webinar. Uh, I obviously represent the smallest of the Nordic countries, so our numbers are, are small, but it's so I'm trying to do everything sort of by capita. So uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, it looked uh, really big. This is the uh, this graph here shows the uh, uh, new cases per million people, people uh, smoothed out over seven days in uh, the Nordic countries. And as you can see, we had a very sharp takeoff in Iceland. And unfortunately, uh, a part of that was a, a small pandemic uh, that was initiated in one of our ICUs uh, when a few of our uh, doctors and nurses came uh, back home from, uh, uh, from Italy. Uh, 
So as you can see, it looked it looked pretty bad at the beginning. So we shared a lot of the concerns that uh, our our Scandinavian colleagues have mentioned that uh, we were concerned that our resources were gonna uh, were gonna be cut short, and then we would have to uh, enter crisis mode if this was to continue. Uh, but I think as the pandemic progressed, uh, we, uh, we, we saw that our numbers weren't that bad. So this is the updated num uh, figure that includes the entire pandemic. And here you can see uh, the, the small peak at the beginning for Iceland. And then we had a second wave in October. And things have been relatively stable since, since then. And obviously compared to a lot of our, uh, some of our colleagues in in Sweden and Denmark, uh, our numbers were, were actually quite quite uh, quite small, and, and we were able to manage this uh, uh, with some ease. Although it was definitely hard at times. So uh, I think overall in the in the country, we we uh, had an early adoption of test trace isolate, and this uh, was very aggressively done. Uh, we actually. From the get-go, we had a very easy access to PCR testing for the for for the virus. Uh, this was largely sparked by uh, one uh, our private genomics company, Deco Genetics, that uh, converted their entire operation just to uh, assist the government with uh, dealing with COVID. So we had we had a very easy access to um, to PCR testing from the from the get-go. It was just the sampling pins that were uh, limited at some time point. So uh, it was easy to uh, test everybody who was symptomatic and then just offer you know, a wide range of testing as the pandemic uh, grew. Obviously, we are, we are a small island with just a single post of entry. So it's, it's relatively easy to close the country and then uh, uh, put in place very strict screening policies when people are entering. So that was obviously uh, helpful as well. And then people in general uh, followed, the, <laughs> followed the rules. Uh, so our numbers ended up being, you know, pretty pretty reasonable. Uh, uh, so uh, as a part of the nationwide response, the Landspitale University Hospital, it's a single university hospital in Iceland, he uh, initiated a COVID-19 outpatient clinic, and uh, they uh, deployed an army of uh, nurses and young physicians, mostly that were tasked with uh, having phone contact with every person uh, who was po tested positive for the virus to risk stratify them and then to reassess the risk uh, on a daily or, uh, or every other day basis. Uh, they were able to see patients uh, in the, this outpatient clinic if needed, draw labs and do x-rays and everything else. And then there were specific wards designated with COVID-19. So whenever somebody needed uh, escalation of care, uh, there was a relatively streamlined uh, process to do this. Uh, and mostly uh, by means of uh, the clinic had a direct admission privileges to the uh, specific ward. So we were able to largely bypass our emergency room and sort of keep them uh, COVID free. And then uh, we had obviously daily uh, meetings with the, the ward team to discuss individuals that are discharged, being discharged from our ICU and, and uh, other potential uh, admissions. So we, we had a, a pretty good grasp of things. Uh, essentially, there are two hospitals in the country that have ICU capacity. Uh, Landspital is here in the Reykjavik area, and they unfortunately have, uh, uh, we have two ICUs that are currently in two locations that are roughly two and a half kilometers apart. And this is uh, a challenge, as you can see in the picture, when we had to transport the patients between the ICU to level out the, the burden of, of care between the units. Uh, Akureyri Regional Hospital has a small ICU, but they were able to upscale it. So they are appro approximately uh, 40 minutes flight away. So, uh, but they have no ECMO uh, capability or anything else, but they can certainly do ventilatory management and RRT if needed. Uh, our ICUs are staffed by anesthesiologists and intensivists that work both in the ICU and, and OR. Uh, I think the biggest challenge that we have uh, been trying to highlight with our government for a while now, um, with limited success, is that uh, our ICU capacity is, is, is pretty low. We have, uh, during normal operations, we have 16 beds available in the entire country, three in Akureyri and 13 in uh, Landspitali, uh, and there are no high dependency units. So uh, this, is, uh, this can be a, a, a challenge. I'm just showing here you uh, here a comparison. So this is from uh, a publication that uh, the, the Nordic countries are uh, collectively and uh, preparing. 
And this shows the number of ICU beds per million individuals prior to the pandemic. And Iceland is here relatively low, 43, close to Norway and Sweden. Uh, and Finland and Denmark have it a little bit uh, better. And this shows the search uh, re response in all of the countries. And as you can see, we uh, were able to, uh, we, we had plans in place to almost uh, triple our ICU uh, capacity to 39 beds. Uh, giving us the uh, uh, 107 beds per million individuals, which is very comparable to the other Nordic countries. So, uh, but we are the only uh, Nordic country that does not have high dependency or step down beds available prior to COVID, and we did not have it in during the pandemic. So this is obviously, even though we're small, our, our ICU beds are, are really small, <laughs> and this is uh, was a considerable challenge. So as most countries did, we uh, postponed all elective surgeries uh, at two time points during the pandemic in the beginning and then again in October. We also closed uh, all outpatient procedures in private practice uh, during the first pandemic for a few weeks. And this allowed us obviously to, um, to ask the nurses and doctors working in private practice to join us at the hospital for a little bit and also to uh, to uh, mitigate the risk of complications arising from elective procedures and affecting the, uh, the bed status of uh, the ICU. We uh, were forced obviously to convert our PACU space to the ICU. We used it in the first wave, but not the second wave. And then we, we uh, deployed a lot of nurses, both from anesthesia as well as uh, some of our operating room nurses joined the ICU. And then we, we uh, also had help from other departments, as well as uh, nurses and uh, anesthesiologists who had been working in private practice. So this was obviously very, very helpful to our uh, response as we had to wrap up the, the call uh, considerable, considerably. Uh, I think it's interesting to look at the bo both of the waves in uh, light of uh, the treatment that's being provided, uh, especially in the light of the evidence for its uh, benefits. So in the first wave in um, March and April of 2020, we had 27 admissions. Uh, predominantly, those patients did not receive any steroids. Uh, they did receive hydroxychloroquine and tocilizumab, uh, the majority of them. Uh, remdesivir was not available. We did use prone positioning early on, as well as invasive ventila ventilation. And we, uh, in the first way, we did deploy a strategy of aggressive diuresis. Um, during the second wave uh, that started in October and lasted almost through Christmas, uh, we, I think we, it's safe to say that we were more evidence-based in our ICU management. Uh, it's very interesting to compare those two waves. Uh, here, all of the patients in the ICU received dexamethasone. Nobody received... Uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine or tocilizumab. We had remdesivir for the, the second, sickest patients and, and uh, almost all who entered the ICU had that. We continued our use of prone positioning and uh, mechanical ventilation as needed. Uh, and we, we, were, uh, we didn't follow a strict diuresis uh, protocol during the second wave. So definitely some changes in the management. And I would say that the second wave management was uh, much more <laughs> evidence-based. Uh, prone positioning happened for 40 of the patients and 56% of them had invasive ventilation. I think it's important to keep in mind here that we uh, we don't have step down or high dependency units. So I think our threshold for admitting somebody to the ICU was uh, lower than with our Nordic colleagues. So obviously we were able to avoid mechanical ventilation uh, probably because the patients were a little less sick than, than uh, the Scandinavian colleagues have uh, described in their ICUs. We had no use of ECMO. We did transfer a couple of patients to the location that has ECMO uh, capacity just in case it was needed. Uh, we definitely considered it for at least four patients, but this was never needed. And 4% of our population received uh, renal replacement therapy. As you can see, there's a lot of logistics moving these patients in these uh, hoods to transport them between the ICUs when needed. Yeah. Here's the outcomes. I think uh, for the, the country in whole, uh, we had 5% of patients who tested PCR positive for, uh, for COVID uh, required uh, an admission to the hospital. 0.7% uh, of the patients required an admission to the ICU, which is obviously much lower than we were concerned about at the beginning of the pandemic. 
uh, but this uh, obviously was uh, biased by the availability of PCR testing. Uh, overall mortality in the country was 0.5%. Uh, and uh, I think you know the the biggest tragedy of COVID nineteen in Iceland was actually that we had an outbreak in our geriatric ward at Landspitali, uh, which resulted in thirteen deaths. And this uh, was a big blow to our COVID response. And obviously, I think this is the most tragic outcome of of COVID nineteen in in Iceland. This this outbreak in our geriatric ward. Uh, none of the the patients in geriatric ward entered the uh, ICU. Um, as they were uh, deemed to be unable to benefit from ICU level care. Uh, from For the patients who entered the ICU, we had 13% uh, mortality, and this was comparable between the first and the second wave, and the hospital mortality was slightly higher as um, seen in other Scandinavian and Nordic countries as well, uh, around 17%. I think in the summary, uh, we, we had the backbone of very well executed pu public health response. So we uh, we were able to manage the overall pandemic pretty well. We had uh, therefore a total number of ICU admissions that was uh, manageable. Uh, I think our concern with the low availability of ICU beds and no high dependency units, we were forced to completely overhaul uh, the structure of our ICUs. And perhaps this wouldn't have been as drastic if we had had more uh, capacity in the beginning. I think our outcomes are probably comparable to the other Nordic countries. And here you can see the ICUs uh, a week apart, everything booming with COVID patients. And then a week later, this is the first week of May in 2020, uh, where uh, everything is quiet again. Uh, we are preparing, along with our uh, Nordic colleagues, a manuscript describing search planning and clinical course, and I hope to have this submitted, uh, uh, you know, within a couple of weeks. Uh, so hopefully you will be able to read through the, 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 the comparison between the Nordic countries uh, relatively quickly. And right now we have a brand new volcano. We have tourists flooding the country again this summer, so things are pretty much back to normal. We haven't had an ICU admission for COVID uh, for about five months now. And uh, we're, we're really starting to see the economy and the tourism picking up again. And this, the timing of the eruption couldn't have been better to, to uh, pick up the, where we left off in terms of tourism and, and the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you so, Thank much, you so Martin. much, Martin. I think perhaps Thank only so someone from Iceland, Iceland would consider a new volcano, volcano good news. Good news. Um, <laughs> But it is now my uh, privilege to uh, introduce our next speaker, one of only three speakers that are actually uh, here, uh, Jon Henrik Låke, a colleague from um, Oslo University Hospital. Go ahead. Thank you very much. If I could have my presentation on the screen, please. Thank you. Um, so the Norwegian uh, description of this is a result of a collaboration between the Oslo University Hospital and the Norwegian Intensive Care Registry, uh, now rebranded as the Norwegian Intensive Care and Pandemic Registry. Uh, and it uh, is uh, supported by the Norwegian Research uh, Council. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, the Norwegian pandemic was, in, uh, was declared by the Institute of Public Health late January um, to, uh, 2020. And um, uh, what is stated here is that we must be prepared for this epidemic spreading throughout the world. It will be a pandemic which even Norway will not escape. Uh, this was a clear warning to everyone and, and of course uh, the question is then how did we respond and how were we prepared? The timeline is given here. So from uh, February uh, to June uh, we can say that the first uh, cases of COVID-19 was a traveler from China, uh, a woman living uh, in the north of Norway who had recently been to, to China at home actually, and uh, she appeared in the news uh, late February. Um, but apart from that, people started arriving from northern Italy, uh, Austria, the UK and Spain uh, late February. They had been on winter holiday and uh, some of them came back uh, infected with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 
virus. Then there was a small outbreak at the Department of Ophthalmology in, at Oslo University, which really described how vulnerable we were because this is the only ophthalmology department in uh, the capital region and it closed down, so patients had to be moved to other cities for uh, uh, emergency care. Following this, there was a very important webinar for ICU practitioners uh, organized by the uh, Directorate of Health. Uh, and uh, in this uh, evidence-based guidelines for the management of patients with uh, respiratory failure were presented. And there was a very important contribution from Italy with uh, Giacomo Grasselli, who many, many will know as, as one of the big contribu uh, contributors of, of information from Italy. And I think his uh, stark warning that what we were facing uh, made a great impression on both uh, physicians who participated at the webinar, but also on the health authorities. And uh, quickly following this, we had our first ICU admission uh, uh, in, in, uh, at the 10th of March 2020, and then uh, the first COVID-19 associated death, 93-year-old gentleman. And um, uh, on the 12th of March 2020, we had a society-wide lockdown that proved to be very effective. Uh, so that already late April, uh, we ha started a slow lifting of restrictions. And then the summer passed on quite uneventful. Uh, when the autumn came, we had a slow burn. And uh, then we had a third wave uh, from uh, Christmas until now. All in all, this has resulted in 125,000 positive cases, 4,500 hospitalized, 826 in the ICU, 783 deaths in total, um, 280 deaths in hospital, and this is noticeable because many deaths uh, occurs, has occurred in nursing homes. Uh, there were 166 deaths in the ICU, uh, and this totals 145 deaths per million population. A few facts about Norway. Uh, it's a population of 5.3 million, half of that in Sweden, and roughly the same as in Finland, Denmark, and Scotland, if you like. Most of the population is um, centered around the coast. And uh, especially in the capital region, which also took the brunt of uh, uh, the number of cases uh, presented to Norwegian hospitals. So, as in Finland, it has been a very geographically uneven distribution of uh, cases. Uh, you have already seen the numbers of ICU beds uh, per 100,000. Uh, my numbers are 5.4 per 100,000, which places us on a pretty low level in the European context. Um, the Norwegian numbers are presented here. Uh, the first wave has uh, uh, been rather well characterized, and we are going to describe the uh, second and third way better. I indicate uh, the entry points of uh, the use of dexamethasone and uh, uh, vaccines on a large scale. So by uh, autumn last year, most patients did receive dexamethasone and uh, vaccination started um, around Christmas um, last year. Uh, the findings from the first wave have been described in the paper, so I won't go into very much details about that. Uh, just mention that overall mortality was uh, slightly less than uh, 20%, slightly above 20% in ventilated patients, and with a strong age uh, dependency. So uh, this could be divided up further, but as the median age was around 63, we, as many others, have uh, divided this into those above and below 65 years of age, and you can see that age makes a huge impact on mortality. And this mortality has been fairly consistent uh, throughout uh, the pandemic. Um, you can see that uh, uh, 
The blue graphs indicate the number of uh, ICU patients and the red uh, line indicates mortality and you can see that it has been as expected um, from the first wave throughout the, the next waves um, but with a slightly higher ICU mortality in the autumn of uh, 2020. And this is um, probably explained by the fact that uh, uh, the, the median age of uh, patients in the autumn of 2020 went a little bit up. Um, so the red dots indicate ICU mortality, and the green dots indicate hospital mortality, and as you can see, hospital mortality stayed about the same and then has climbed down a little bit in the spring of uh, this year. But all in all, a quite uh, consistent mortality figures. Um, age distribution is as... Uh, in other uh, Norwegian ICU patients, I would say. So I, I believe that uh, admission policies haven't really changed uh, during the pandemic. It has been uh, consistent with practices used uh, previously. And um, the, the same goes for comorbidities, which uh, are the usual contenders. When it comes to uh, use of mechanical ventilation, this has apparently been higher than in the other Norwegian countries, so around 85%. And uh, uh, ECMO has been used only sparingly, and I would say with uh, moderate uh, success. Um, I would like to point out that, that the, the case mix of these patients, uh, uh, apart from age is of course very important in explaining why mortality is different. It was mentioned that in, in Iceland uh, very few patients uh, required renal re replacement therapy. Uh, in Norway uh, about 15% of patients required renal re replacement therapy and it had a huge impact on mortality. And it is uh, actually similar to the impact of having a chronic uh, kidney disease. So, so whether you see this as a way of dying or uh, 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 something that actually characterizes uh, patients is, of course, disputable. But, but we need to look into this uh, to explain mortality differences. And this has actually been described as one of the factors of great variability between uh, countries. And um, uh, this brings me to one of the last slides, uh, which is actually the elephant in the room here. The cross-country variation in COVID-19 mortality rates is, of course, something that will come up in an international setting. But if we want to look at this in a uh, uh, way which does not cause emotions and conflict, we should really look into what may cause such uh, variability. And I would think we would easily find that case mix, that is acute physiology, uh, demographics, socioeconomic status, uh, hospital strain, etc., will have uh, a large impact, and those are the factors that we should study before making uh, judgments about uh, how hospitals have performed. So with that, I would like to finish my talk. The pandemic in Norway has been a breeze, in my opinion. That does not mean that colleagues in some hospitals have had to uh, struggle because of the uneven distribution of patients, but uh, we are looking forward to a bright and sunny summer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jon Henrik. Uh, the next uh, presenter is uh, from uh, Sweden. Uh, she is currently in Australia due to some uh, uh, other reasons. Uh, this is Michelle Shu. Uh, she is an academic chair and professor in anesthesiology, intensive care, and acute care in Linköping University Hospital in Sweden. And uh, she has a large research interest uh, involving almost all areas in the anesthesia intensive care. So, Michelle, uh, tell us about the Swedish experience. 
Thank you very much, Toringa, uh, for that kind introduction and for asking me to present the uh, Swedish experience. I'll just share my screen here. Um, just one moment. Can you all see my screen? But I think everyone can see my screen. Yes. So, so in the beginning of 2020, nobody could have anticipated how COVID-19 would change our lives. And Sweden obviously stands out among the Nordic countries in terms of having a high number of confirmed SARS-CoV-2 cases per million population, um, a larger proportion of hospitalizations, as well as a large number of ICU admissions, has, as has been already described described and although some of these numbers are invariably linked to testing and tracing capacity it's not surprising that many people have questioned how Sweden's public health policy has affected outcomes during the pandemic and in reality it's not straightforward I keep thinking about um, Jon Hendrik's uh, elephant in the boardroom picture you know put six blind men in a room and all will describe the elephant differently and I'll leave it to Do Dr Anders Tegnell our state epidemiologist to shed more light on this uh, later on today and the fact is um, intensive care has never uh, been more in the spotlight and one of the positive consequences, if, if I may, uh, of this pandemic has been the increased awareness of the meaning of intensive care. Um, I think everybody has heard the word intensive care unit now, and, um, and we all know um, uh, what we do every day um, that many people have taken for granted for years and years. And early in the pandemic, there was so much uncertainty and concern regarding um, our intensive care capacity. Um, you heard uh, Toringa talk to you about, um, uh, about the Nordic response and Jon Hendrik about Graceli's uh, webinar and, and many doomsday reports were circulating and there were a lot of warnings from other countries as well, which we were very grateful for. And many of these concerns not, um, well, they were not just centered on the availability of beds and ventilators, but also PPE, staffing and ethical issues surrounding triage. And one can absolutely understand these concerns. However, um, in hindsight, I can honestly say that intensive care in Sweden has generally never been gripped by panic. But an unwavering work ethic, I think, and a willingness to work together to meet the largest, the biggest health care challenge that we have seen in decades. And I'm sure um, Professor Steen Robertson will uh, discuss this more in the panel discussion uh, this evening. So on the 22nd of April, we reached our peak capacity um, in intensive care of 1,131 beds. The 28th of April 2020 uh, saw the largest number of ICU patients admitted in Sweden. That was 791 patients. So that, that sounds horrible compared to Finland and, and Norway and, um, and, and Iceland and, and did feel horrible. Um, but this is not so many taking into perspective, perspective of neighbours such as uh, those in the UK, France, Italy, Spain, just to name a few. But these numbers should also be understood within the context of the pre-pandemic numbers of ICU beds. So apart from Portugal, I think Sweden has, um, and probably Iceland now that um, Martin has, uh, has, has presented his, uh, his uh, Iceland statistics, I think Sweden probably has one of the lowest numbers of ICU beds per 100,000 population. So that's five beds per 100,000. But during the first wave of the pandemic, ICU occupancy never exceeded 80% on a national basis. However, this does not, of course, mean that individual hospitals um, under the pandemic were not stressed. So this data is taken from the Swedish Intensive Care Registry that um, covers all ICUs in Sweden, 83 ICUs. And when I checked yesterday, Sweden had admitted 7,660 individual patients with COVID-19 disease. And the population characteristics are very much like those that have already been described from other Nordic countries. Um, but we had um, most of the patients with at least one comorbidity. So over 80% 80, 80 had at least one comorbidity. Um, the median time from debut of symptoms to ICU admission was about 11 days, similar to uh, Iceland. And our median ICU stay is about 12 days. 
ICU occupancy rates have varied considerably during 2020. So this blue graph here, that just shows the daily admissions to ICU during 2020. And the green line here is the um, average daily admissions to ICU in the previous year, so 2000, 2019. So the total number of admissions in 2020 were actually lower than in 2019. And this has very much to do with cancellation of planned major surgical procedures and other procedures requiring ICU admission. What was also interesting was that we observed a dramatic decrease in acute admissions such as those due to AMI and sepsis. What differed and what is not reflected in this graph is the median length of ICU stay which increased from a total of 121,000 um, cases or days per year in 2019 to nearly 156,000 days in 2020. So this was an increase of 28%. The median length of stay per admission for COVID-19 patients in 2020 was 6.1 days compared to a median length of stay of 1.1 days for uh, uh, ICU admission in 2019. Now, these are unclean data, and we anticipate actually that the median length of stay per patient may be considerably longer as a significant proportion of patients are transferred from ICU to ICU. So the median length of stay per patient rather than per admission is actually longer than 6.1 days. So before the Danish study was uh, published in September, two, um, September 2020, um, there was very little national data available regarding the outcomes of uh, COVID-19 patients. And this data is now available for all Nordic countries. And you saw some of that data presented by uh, Martin Sigurdsson. What we knew at that time from reports from other countries was that there was a huge vari variability um, in terms of uh, short-term mortality. And the majority of studies included large proportions of patients that had not completed their ICU admission, giving an overly optimistic estimate of the true mortality rate. Most data were not collected nationally, raising the possibility of selection bias, for example. And we were aware that the Sweden results were particularly under scrutiny due to the per perceived relaxed Swedish public health uh, strategy. So in this paper, we describe um, the patient population and outcomes for all Swedish ICU admissions with COVID-19 during what we call the first wave of the pandemic. So this was spring 2020, and the data were all extracted from the Swedish intensive care registry. There were um, nearly 2,200 admissions, but 1,563 unique patients with full follow-up data. Nearly 40% of uh, the population were aged over 65 and 3.4% were octogenarians. And the reason why I stress this was beca is because we um, were subject to quite a lot of criticism uh, regarding our uh, admission strategies. We, I had lots of emails and lots of phone calls from colleagues all over the world saying that uh, Sweden did not admit octogenarians and that's why um, our Swedish um, numbers look so good. But what we found was that our baseline's character, baseline characteristics were actually very similar to those reported in other studies with a median age of 61, majority males, a moderate SOP score of 54. Notably, however, the SOFA score on admission was four, so that is slow, reflecting the single organ failure nature of the disease. You know, that really characterizes admission for COVID patients in Sweden, which is different from our other ICU patients. The PF ratio was a low 13 kilopascals, and this is probably lower than what has been previously reported in the literature. And just over a quarter of our patients required transfers to another ICU. And this is consistent with the Swedish strategy of sharing workload and creating bed space for those in need of intensive care, rather than applying very stringent triage criteria in those units with overwhelming numbers of patients. So ICU mortality was about 23%. A 30-day mortality was nearly 27%, indicating that those who did not survive generally died during the ICU stay. Uh, we tried to identify risk factors that were most strongly associated with 30-day mortality, and this was largely consistent with what we already knew. Um, so age being male, high sub 3 scores, and comorbidities, of course, played a role. However, what was interesting was that in the multivariable analysis, 
the effect of comorbidities become very much less, except from uh, except for those patients with chronic lung disease. Chronic comorbidities did not really play a role um, in terms of um, its independent association with 30-day mortality. We did, however, find that the presence of new and severe organ failures, severe respiratory failure, and um, acute kidney injury requiring CRT was strongly associated with death. The other thing that was interesting was that um, ICU transfers as a surrogate for ICU capacity was not associated with short-term mortality. So the conclusion from this registry study was that we generally observed generally lower mortality rates than had previously been reported. And although comorbidities were important for outcomes when examined individually, um, their importance decreased in multivariable analyses when other confounders are taken into account. And we also identified that new and severe organ failures were independently associated with this. There was also a signal to harm for COVID-19 pharmacotherapy, which during the first two months of the pandemic, as in Iceland, consisted largely of hydroxychloroquine and inter-ICU transfers as a surrogate of uh, capacity was not associated with mortality. So several challenges remain in our raw data. Uh, we have observed a variation in mortality uh, among COVID-19 ICU patients. So this is 30-day mortality. This is uh, uh, 2020 March through to 2021 February. We haven't studied this formally yet, and we do speculate about whether this could be due to underlying risk profiles, case mix, as Jon Hendrik mentioned, development of complications. Could it be a seasonal variation? And public media has also raised a concern that um, increases in mortality rates last winter, seen here, uh, were possibly linked to ICU capacity and the circulation of new variants. However, from raw data, we do not see a clear link yet between ICU admission and deaths. And the current predominating uh, variant of uh, concern is the alpha, which we do not really see until uh, January uh, 2021. So all these are subjects of ongoing studies. I've only concentrated on short-term mortality as a patient-centered outcome, but we are all aware uh, that mortality alone just does not capture the true consequences of the disease, and these are many. Uh, many su patients suffer from long COVID and post-ICU syndrome. Uh, many suffer from a number of somatic consequences of acute illness, and the need for continued care and support as patients return to hospital is enormous, but not limited to patients that have received intensive care. And one area that has been severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic is perioperative care. And these are graphs from the Swedish perioperative registry. Also, we also call this SPOR. Um, and they show the surgical workload normalized to a standard work week in 2019. So the orange graph here is the national average and the blue, the blue lines are um, each of the 21 county councils in Sweden that are responsible for hospital care. So what you see here is at the height of the pandemic, so this is uh, about week 15 to 20, you will see that there is a decrease in um, perioperative uh, procedures, so surgical procedures of uh, more than 70%. It briefly rose um, during autumn, and then it dipped again very quickly. Uh, this is Christmas and New Year, and it's never really recovered. And we're at about um, minus 20 to 30% of full capacity now. So COVID um, has not only challenged hospital and ICU capacity, but it really has taken its toll on healthcare workers. Uh, our colleagues have continued to provide care to patients despite physical and psychological exhaustion personal risk for infection, concerns about the risk of spread to family members, disease, even death among friends, family, colleagues, as well as patients. And unfortunately, healthcare workers in Sweden have also been exposed to many unnecessary sources of stress, shunned for being possible bearers of infection, singled out by individuals, not satisfied with public health strategies, bearing the brunt of a dis- satisfied community just struggling in itself to cope with the implications of COVID-19 disease. So the consequences of COVID-19 in healthcare workers in Sweden has been enormous. Women make up a disproportionate number of our workforce, 
while trying to fulfill their professional responsibilities, women traditionally carry a disproportionate burden of family needs, including childcare, homeschooling, care for older people, and home care. And I'm curious as to how this pandemic has influenced academic productivity of women relative to men. And I ask you, and I ask the SSIE today to seriously consider how we can best support the needs of our healthcare workers, our biggest asset. Burnout and staffing shortages were already a challenge prior to the pandemic in Sweden, and it's certainly not less of a problem now. How do we truly recognize the contribution of all healthcare workers, and how can we provide true respect, appropriate protection, appropriate compensation? And I don't mean just by the evening clanging of pots and pans as gratifying as that may have been. So I just want to leave you today by saying thank you and by acknowledging all my Swedish colleagues doctors, nurses, nurses aides, wardsmen, cleaners, cooks, pharmacists, physicians, um, dietitians, administrators, so many people, so many more that have provided their services to the ICU community in the most challenging of times. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Michelle. I think some very powerful um, reflections at the end there that um, that we all need to to think more about, and and some extent we will be discussing that a bit more later today. But uh, thank you so much. I think the Swedish data uh, is of special interest to many of us, as you have uh, had the the largest burden in our region. Um, so thank you so much. So last but not least, we have uh, Professor uh, Catherine Roan from the UK. Um, Kathy founded and established the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Center in the UK. So as such, I think she's uniquely positioned to give us the UK perspective. So whenever you're ready, Kathy, please uh, unmute and share your screen. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a real honor to be here with you all. Um, I'm certainly one of the people who really wishes it was uh, with you in person. Um, I have no sort of conflicts of interest apart from the fact uh, the data I'll present derived from ICNARC, and I am the founder and director of ICNARC. I have uh, one disclaimer in that I've come here under false pretenses because the data I have are actually for England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And as you well know, there's an important country called Scotland uh, that makes up the UK. So the data I'll present are for England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. But the themes that I'll present are very much the same as are reported in Scotland. A little bit of background. Uh, we've been in lockdown since the 23rd of March 2020. We've never fully been allowed out of it. We got a bit of a reprieve last summer. Uh, Christmas uh, was cancelled and we were due to come out of lockdown next Thursday and it's just been postponed four weeks. And as I speak now, uh, the Delta variant cases are rising in critical care. They're increasing by about... Uh, 40% and about 40% of those are under 40 years. So they look like a very different cohort of patients. So what am I going to present on? I'm going to present on uh, the adult general critical care units uh, in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. We cover about 286 of them and it covers about the 4,000 uh, or so critical care beds uh, across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So what do we do like everybody else? Uh, and it's been wonderful to hear all that uh, uh, data that, that's been presented. Um, but we too have a, a national audit. And what that normally does is data is submitted, captured, collected, uh, submitted or uploaded monthly, quarterly, and we report quarterly and annually. And it's a sort of quality uh, assessment program. And we decided not to change our data collection uh, at all, but just to ramp it up. And so as soon as units saw a COVID-19 case, probably worth saying that our first case we think was in the end of February, but we didn't bring in proper testing until very early March. Um, and we actually uh, got our first report out on the 10th of March with about 13 cases in, but wanting to support our clinical colleagues. So instead of uh, monthly quarterly, we went to daily uploads as soon as a case was uh, admitted. And then we were reporting to our government, to our clinical colleagues, daily, weekly, monthly, depending on the numbers of cases, and ad hoc. And uh, quite excitedly, you'd get a sort of uh, email that said Boris Johnson would like this on his desk by two o'clock. And it was 10 o'clock in the morning uh, 
which sort of put a bit of a ripple of excitement through uh, those of us at ICNARC. So um, numbers, uh, I've been looking at uh, and listening to the words. Uh, our first wave started early March and that amounted to almost 11,000 uh, admissions uh, with confirmed COVID-19. And our second wave, some people like to call it a second and a third wave, depending on how you like to see these data, it's accumulative, uh, started on the 1st of September and has plateaued, but worryingly is just about rising again. And that almost approached 26,000. So you can see the sort of burden on the system uh, in, I'm going to use the word UK with the caveat it's England, Wales and Northern Ireland just for shorthand. What did that mean in terms of sort of numbers of cases at any point in time? We've heard that these are long staying paces, uh, patients. In the first wave, at one point at the peak, we had about just over 3,800 patients. And in the second wave, although the lengths of stay were slightly shorter, that was uh, 4,000, just over 4,600 patients. So we've seen a fair few patients with uh, COVID-19 in critical care. Who got this is number of patients in critical care per 100,000 population. And really, I guess this is just to show these are regions. You can see Northern Ireland top left and Wales below it there. But you can see in a sort of either twofold or fourfold basis, depending on the comparison, London in the middle at the bottom there was hit worse uh, in terms of uh, cases. And we know why to some extent household crowding, uh, urban dwelling, uh, uh, different sort of uh, diversity uh, mix in the population uh, probably led to uh, a lot of those numbers being higher. Uh, just to give a sort of sense, uh, so what you see here is in the blue or grey line sort of history of sort of pneumonia in critical care. You can see the little rise in December and January and then the sort of plateauing in the middle of the year, sort of those sort of winter rises that we see. And what you can see, just to compare with the kind of numbers we were getting in COVID-19, hash line in 2020, solid line in 21, uh, that these are almost sort of, you know, six to 12 fold what we might normally see. We also, like others, uh, saw things disappear. Uh, so our peaks were in April 20 and January 21. Um, what you can see here is sort of... Uh, acute myocardial infarction uh, appears to disappear from the critical care caseload. Uh, and you can see the gray lines there is the usual sort of admission rate for patients with uh, acute myocardial infarction. This is sort of now looking at, and others have talked about this, sort of uh, the impact on elective and, and non-elective non-COVID type work against sort of the COVID-19 burden and the COVID surge. And you can see in the months of April and the months of January and February, we uh, a little bit sort of around the peaks of January and February, we were moving quite substantially into our surge areas. So surge was a mix of additional beds in critical care units. So they would be in the solid orange bars there and also creation of new areas. Uh, and they're in the kind of the, the sort of slighter hashed bar there. So we definitely sort of, over sort of uh, were burdened in terms of capacity uh, more than uh, our critical care units could contain. Interestingly, uh, every day during the uh, epidemic waves in the UK, uh, the critical care unit reported its crit con status. And you can see here it went from zero to business as usual to one, which most people would report in a usual bad winter, uh, where there's sort of a, maybe a, a flu epidemic or a um, right through to, as you can see, unprecedented, not seen this before, full stretch, oh my goodness, it's all going crazy, right through to um, actually starting to have to sort of uh, deny admission or, or, or um, triage by resource or, or whatever. And this is how it looks. And you can see, and I think John was talking about looking at strain in due course, and we are looking at strain. You can really see the yellow sort of the unprecedented, the three full stretch and very small amounts of red where we actually go right over uh, what was what could be contained, but following very much those peaks in the UK, uh, as I've described. 
And in terms of days, 62% of days, so uh, the sort of 300, 400, 500 days that we've been covering uh, was business as usual. But you can see reasonable, substantial proportions where my clinical colleagues heroically uh, across the board were actually dealing with sort of bad times or unprecedented times and trying to deliver. And like everybody else, we were pulling in other critical care, uh, sorry, other clinical colleagues to help deliver critical care and also compromising on the critical care standards for staffing that the UK holds sort of dear in terms of delivering critical care. What this also led to, and this isn't what we try to do normally, so the blue line here is sort of being sent off for things like ECMO or more specialist critical care, but we try usually not to have transfers for comparable critical care, i.e. that you're only being moved because there's not enough room where you are. And as you can see here, it was nearly 8% of cases that had to be transferred uh, in the first wave and it of 10-12% uh, in uh, the second wave. And what was more worrying really was in the second wave that about a quarter of these transfers were being transferred outside a local geographical area. So we had people moving many hundreds of miles uh, just to try and alleviate burden in those regions where it was highest. In terms of uh, characteristics of patients, what I've got here is, if you like, the second wave first, i.e. the latest wave, compared with the uh, first wave on the right. And as you can see, a lot of the characteristics are similar to those we've heard. Clearly, like others, we saw the predisposition both for hospitalization and for critical care admission for males. And that distribution seemed to show across the age distribution really kicking off for uh, those over 40, where the predisposition for males to outnumber females can be seen sort of almost sort of two or more fold. We were very keen early on to be sure that uh, the boys were getting as good care as the girls. And very early on, we sort of uh, reinforced to our clinical colleagues that despite, if you like, the higher rate of men being admitted, the outcomes using a Cox proportional hazards regression model indicated that the outcomes were similar, uh, whether you were a male or a female. The other thing, again, very, very early on, on the 3rd of April, uh, we noticed this sort of, this is when we're comparing at this point, this is the first wave, but we're comparing now with viral pneumonia from previous years, because that was sort of seen to be the best comparator population. We began to see this potential predisposition of non-white ethnicity to be more likely to be critically ill with COVID-19 and, and more likely admitted. And we were conscious that uh, London was where the wave was sort of uh, burgeoning at that point and London has a diverse population. So we did a kind of a local population sort of adjustment on this. So sort of uh, looking at the areas, the geographical areas that people came out from the ethnic mix of those areas and adjusting for that using the residential postcode. But we still found this overrepresentation of non-white groups. And that was, as I'm sure people are well aware, picked up in the press. And another sort of uh, element of what we've tried to do a lot of during the epidemic in the UK is actually share our data responsibly with other groups. And this was actually a Lancet publication that then looked at that whole patient trajectory and the risk for hospitalization, intensive care unit admission, as well as outcomes over the UK epidemic waves. And as you can see here, this is just the uh, looking at the admitted to ICU risk. And you can see across all the non-white ethnicities, this was raised uh, in terms of a now much more sophisticated using a lot of the uh, primary care variables in the uh, hazard model. I think there's one minute left. Oh, right. OK, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, yes. OK, I will run on. Uh, deprivation, we saw higher deprivation. Uh, we also saw higher body mass index. Um, we also tried to be responsible, informatively censoring outcomes. And we would criticize for doing this very early on. Here you can see died in ICU based on 196 patients informatively censored actually turned out to be not an unreasonable when we had the whole of the first wave. 
Um, again, second wave outcomes were similar. Um, risk adjustment with our usual model suggested that uh, our usual models didn't apply, mainly because there were these long stays. And we built a model based on the 28 day in hospital mortality. And that was then used to make comparisons here against predicted and observed mortality across the pandemic. Again, seeing that dexamethasone being too late for the early drop in mortality, but maybe tocilizumab having some role in the tail end of the second wave. And perhaps one bit of good news is in the second wave, using that risk model across every patient group, we saw improvements in terms of hazard ratio for 28 day in hospital mortality. Um, like others, we saw a drop in ventilation from the first wave to the second wave and a concomitant drop in renal support uh, too. I'll jump that. Uh, we reported weekly uh, for all the periods of the high peak. Monthly, we're currently in monthly, but expecting to go back to weekly soon. And I probably finish with a global media company who scans the global media got in touch with us and told us that potential reach of our reports was over half the world population at 4.6 billion. So we uh, felt uh, a very huge import to uh, report responsibly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cathy. Um, now we're going to the next session, which is called Research and uh, Treatment Modalities During the Pandemic. And um, in the next session now, I will tell you when you have two minutes left uh, uh, to talk so that we stick to the time schedule um, and we take the next person on the agenda that can uh, start uh, his lecture uh, and that is uh, Andreas Baratua is a uh, uh, anesthesiologist and intensivist and leader of the intensive care team at Rikshospitalet at Oslo University Hospital. Uh, he has been involved in the uh, WHO solidarity studies and will present that to us now. Are you ready, Andreas? I'm very grateful. Uh, I'm pleased to be invited to this webinar. And as the title says, I'm going to present the WHO uh, mm, solidarity study uh, and I will focus a little bit uh, extra on um, Remdesivir because I find it interesting that uh, we are interpreting the results differently around the world. But first I think we need to go back to 2014, the outbreak uh, break of uh, the Ebola uh, crisis um, striking close to 30,000 people. And during that time, they tested uh, numerous therapies against this virus, and this included hydroxychloroquine, monoclonal antibodies, and also remdesivir, trying to determine whether any of these drugs or intervention could have any effect against the virus. At the end of this outbreak, uh, none of the interventions proved to be effective or safe, and we could wonder why didn't they manage to find out anything and uh, there are probably several reasons behind this, but lack of governance, they were not prepared. Studies were often single group interventions without the proper control group. And the only RCT that was initiated by NIH was started too late and not able to conclude before the outbreak ceased. And uh, the editor of JAMA pinpointed this uh, elegantly in March, 2020, saying that Optimally, during an outbreak, the type of RCTs that should be prioritized are ones with an adaptive designs, which are able to rapidly accept or reject multiple experimental therapies throughout the trial, while being adequately powered for meaningful clinical outcomes. And based on this knowledge, WHO established an adaptive trial, the Solidary Study, including four interventional arms, Remdesivir, Lupinavir, interferon beta and hydroxychloroquine. Additionally, they included a standard of care group as a control. Uh, and the primary endpoint was all cause in hospital mortality, secondary endpoints, duration of hospital stay, and time to first receiving ventilation or admission to ICU. And it's important to understand that the setup was very simple. The collection of patient entry data was limited, monitoring, 
during hospitalization was limited, basically only recording serious adverse reaction. And by applying such a simple design, WHO enabled participation of, uh, uh, from overcrowded hospital as well as from low income countries. And the intention with this adaptive platform was to implement new arms after they were able to conclude whether their studied interventions had proven efficacy or not. Although it has hardly any clinical evidence backing the selection of these interventional drugs, it was at least some preclinical pre -clinical results suggesting uh, possible me mechanisms of action and thus advocating the use in clinical trial. Importantly, the um, uh, eager and willingness to intervene to do something was not only prominent in the scientific society, but also rather prominent and an extended wish among all of us. And I don't think uh, we will forget Donald Trump uh, broadcasting uh, the supreme usefulness of chlor uh, chloroquine or, or hydroxychloroquine. And we will not forget Norwegian doctors uh, prescribing uh, hydroxychloroquine to themselves or uh, family. And this was done in such a way that it was put on a ration list. Um, so this is important to remember. And if we didn't have these kind of trials, probably we would still go out and um, um, eat this kind of medication. Two large trials were established last spring, the Solidarity Trial and the Recovery UK based. And this is just a timeline showing both trials. And it's quite uh, impressive how recovery managed to become a trial massively recruiting patients uh, in the early phase. And already in May 2020, they had randomized and included 10,000 patients, whereas the WHO solidarity trial um, recruiting patients from more than 30 countries um, did not reach its number until end of August or in the beginning of September. In Norway, we established a solidarity add-on trial the Nord Solidarity Trial, a more complex study, including biobanking and a far closer follow-up and monitoring of the patients, also including a three months follow-up. Um, and as you see here from the timeline, Nord Solidarity Trial actually managed to include the very first patient into the WHO Solidarity Trial at the end of March. And I think uh, we had a kind of massive enthusiasm in our country. Uh, 29 hospitals joined the study and 23 of these hospitals recruited patients. So it was uh, a huge effort uh, lasting a couple of intense weeks uh, last year uh, managing this. So it was, uh, we, we could be quite proud after this effort uh, one year ago. But why didn't WHO manage to include more patients initially? Well, this is probably a complicated uh, question, but uh, it may be explained by delayed approvals from national drug regulators, ethical committees, and probably also due to the different countries' health ministries. Italy, for instance, they um, didn't manage to include the patient for before May last year, even though they were hit by the pandemic very early. The figure here shows results from the four different treatment regimens that were tested, Bremdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, lupinavir, and interferon. And the y-axis um, represent uh, the mortality rate, and while, while the x-axis represent days since randomizations. And all, demo, all interventions demonstrated no or little effect on hospitalized patients with COVID with respect to mortality, with respect to initiation of ventilation and duration of hospital stay. Already in May, 2020, results from the first RCT on Remdesivir were released advocating the use of this drug as it shortened hospital stay. Later in October, data from the solidarity study was presented. And if you look closer to these data on remdesivir, severely ill patients ventilated did not benefit on remdesivir. 
It could even look like they had a worse outcome, but this different, the difference between the remdesivir group and the control group is not significant. When it comes to non-ventilated group, we also find a difference here uh, in favor of remdesivir, but again, it is not significant. But we have, though, a small absolute re re uh, risk reduction of 1.2%. And if you look to this uh, confidence interval, it embraced one, but with small margins. So this triggered a discussion whether one should continue to recruit patients to remdesivir or not. Uh, we, in the steering committee in Ur Solidarity, we decided not to continue to include patients because, I mean, we could mm, pre mm, presume that this uh, uh, risk reduction was significant and that would imply a number needed to treat of 83 patients, so we found it not worth it. And this was a kind of similar attitude among uh, in different countries, but WHO centrally, they want to continue the study. In the NUR solidarity trial, we measured viral load during hospital stay, and no increased decline rate of the virus was observed in the remdesivir group compared to standard of care. And we speculated whether early treatment with antiviral treatment could benefit the patient, but this was not the case. Patients receiving remdesivir before seven days didn't benefit more than standard of care or nothing happened happened with the viral uh, load. It declined similarly fast in both groups. And if we could also speculate whether patients presenting at admission with a high viral load would benefit from remdesivir, but this was not the case. Remdesivir didn't have any impact on viral clearance. So no signal uh, confirmed any effect of remdesivir whatsoever. The remdesivir story continue and now start a part which I find quite strange because at the end of September 2020, the WHO solidarity results were ready. Then according to the contract, the pharmaceutical company delivering remdesivir uh, received the results according to their regulated contract. Um, a bit more than one week later, remdesivir was bought by the European Commission uh, for 70 million euros. A week after this, then finally the results become published and available uh, for all. And I Anybody think else? quite strange, left. quite strange that they managed to 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 sell out this uh, medication, even though they knew that results were in um, not favoring remdesivir at all. This is not all. October 2020, after the results had been public, FDA approved remdesivir as the first treatment for COVID-19, and NIH implements remdesivir in the guidelines for hospitalized patients. Also in Norway, Norwegian authorities grants 40 million Norwegian kroner for buying remdesivir. Contrary to this, we have the WHO Living Guideline on Drugs for COVID, suggesting no remdesivir to all patients with COVID-19 at any severity. And the European Medical Agency has not approved remdesivir, and we are and still we are awaiting the last data on this from WHO as they continue the study and probably have included a couple of thousand more patients. Today, we have different practices in European. The public or uh, the main attitude is not to use it, on the other side of the Atlantic Sea, we have uh, the attitude that it should be used. And the medical uh, knowledge and um, evidence suggests, in my opinion, quite clearly that it should not be used. So in conclusion, solidarity is a global study that enabled to conclude on the efficacy of different drugs. And I think it's inspiring and also quite impressive that this organization managed to launch such a global study. During a pandemic, large adaptive RCTs are mandatory. Too many small studies have been conducted, not able to conclude. And a multinational research platform strategy needs to be developed for the future. And this has partly been done, at least for the ongoing pandemic. Use Solid Act, which is a pan-European platform for pandemic research and preparedness, is now uh, including patients 
um, elucidating the f efficacy of varicitinib and uh, hopefully this kind of research network work can continue after this pandemic has ceased. So that was all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Andreas. I think very impressive presentation and, and very impressive piece of work you have done. Now, we certainly do want to hear about uh, COVID-19 and RDS. So I hope that Bodil Rasmussen has uh, resolved her technical issues. First of all, I want to thank you and uh, the organizers for inviting me to give this talk about pacifizology and treatment modalities. We, as intensivists and, and anesthesiologists, we are very familiar with RDS. And as you see in the picture, we have this well-known picture of RDS, where we have the normal alveoli, mm -hmm. this the small loss. intestinal space, mm -hmm. and the capillary bed uh, in, uh, in non-deceased patients. And on the right side, you have this inflammatory mediators, fluid and uh, damaged epithelial cells, uh, extravasation of water from the alveoli and the vessels, uh, and we have this huge impaired gas exchange. And what we all know is that when we have the severe RDS, uh, we have hypoxemia, bilateral infiltrates, we have a low compliance, we need to use high PEEP, and we need to use uh, a higher expired volume. But the question is whether COVID-19 pneumonia is RDS or not. It was indeed different in the spring last year at the beginning of the pandemic because those patients we saw uh, did not, uh, was not the same as we have seen with RDS based on influenza or bacteria. Uh, and the phenomenon happy hypoxemia was introduced. And what we saw was patients who do not complain of dyspnea they have no sense of restlessness, uh, they have no rapid swallowing, and they don't uh, need the use of accessory muscles. And that was interesting because it was despite of devastating thoracic CT scans, and we have this dramatically low pressure of arterial oxygen despite of massive amount of oxygen therapy. In the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, Gazzinoni uh, introduced or asked the question whether there were different respiratory treatments for different phenotypes. And what, ex um, what surprised us all was that we have this type L, he, he named it type L phenotypes, because we have surprisingly high or normal compliance. We also saw low ventilation perfusion ratio and then we have a low lung weight and low recruitability. The other type was type H, uh, and it was much more uh, an RDS, which we know from, from other causes of RDS. We have low compliance, we have high right to left shunt, we have high lung weight, and we, the, pay, the lungs were recruitable. What surprised us all was that uh, it seems as if the pathophysiology of COVID-19 is uh, endotheliopathy. Uh, and what you can see in this picture is that it's all going on in the vessels. It's both in the capillary bed, but it's also in the venules and the arterioles. And what happened is that when you have an area of hypoxia, we normally get a compensatory hypoxic vascular uh, vasoconstriction, but this function was not working. We, it was lost. Uh, we also have thrombosis in the, in the vessels. And we all know that the number of a ACE2 in, uh, receptors in the lungs are very, very high, but the renin angiotensin system was dysregulated. And as a consequence, we have this hyperperfusion of the lungs, which means that we induced, uh, the patient had ventilation perfusion mismatch, and we also see patients with very high shunts, leading to hypoxia. So this vasoplegia is new uh, for us. And uh, this is a study uh, just published uh, uh, some month ago where patients with uh, moderate uh, COVID-19 pneumonia and awake uh, uh, 
was uh, some they were they had some cryobiopsies and what uh, the uh, researchers saw was that we had this vasoplegia with distension of the capillary bed and the venules and the arterioles meaning that we have a hyperperfusion in areas with normal ventilation and that lead to VQ mismatch what we also saw during the uh, we see during the pandemic is that we have no lung, the majority of patients have no recruitable lungs. But what you can see in this picture is that when they turn the patient in, in prone positioning, the uh, over distension of the vessels uh, diminished and we get this better balance between the ventilation and perfusion. And they say the same they observed when, when you put on positive end expiratory pressure or CPAP, you can. Uh, diminish this over uh, distension of the vessels, meaning that you have a better balance between ventilation and perfusion. During the um, uh, development of COVID-19 pneumonia, uh, in the early stage, you have uh, the virus in the alveoli that they, uh, they transfer, uh, you have this transfer from the alveoli to the vessels. Uh, and what you see is there's no fluid in the alveoli. And, and that's also characteristic for those patients because very few of them had secretion in the early phase of, of the COVID-19 pneumonia. But what happened in the later stages is that you have this huge endothelial damage. You have this... Uh, uh, blocks of receptors, the AC, uh, AC2 receptors, and you have the thrombi in the uh, capillary bed, the nose and arterioles. So this will induce a, a substantial VQ mismatch. And there's several names of this um, uh, this pathophysiology happen in the vessels. It's can call pulmonary vasculitis or uh, endothelial patty. Uh, um, and what happening, what's is happening is that if you look at the picture to the left, we have the hypoxic state at the top where you have uh, patients with moderate hypox hypoxia. And what we would have expected is that we have, would have a hypoxic vasoconstriction. Uh, we will have increased ventilatory effort and we will have an increase in cardiac output. But all these compensatory mechanisms is impaired when you have the COVID-19 infection. When the patients deteriorate to more severe hypoxemia, they, uh, lost the, um, the, they, they lost the capability of compensating for the hypoxia. And we get this three different um, uh, mechanism, which is part of the uh, more severe hypoxemia that we see in these patients. We have the thrombi in the, uh, in the microvessels leading to, to, to shunts. We have the endothelial uh, inflammation and we have pleural effusion. And also we have an increased diffusion barrier with alveolitis and pulmonary edema and my own experience, and, and also what you can see in the literature is that we have to, to, um, to be very much aware of not overloading, fluid overloading these patients because they have a tendency of, of having pulmonary edema. And then we have increased right to left shunt with consolidation uh, and fibrosis in the later stage, and Alexis is in that. Budil, uh, two minutes left. Pulmonary vasculitis will substantially do mismatch. We also have to remember that what we saw earlier in RDS was microtrombi in the capillary bed. What we have seen during the pandemic is that these trombi can be in the large venous, in the large arterioles, but all. Budil, two minutes left. The key message is, is that. This endotheliitis might be a common factor, both in the respiratory and non-respiratory manifestation. The inflammatory response is relatively mild compared to other cases of RDS. And this is a new entity of pathophysiology. So we have to remember this is the beginning of COVID-19-associated RDS. There's a lot of things that we do not yet know. 
We know that uh, we have this L type and H type, but what you can see in the picture at the, at the bottom, during the last year, 70 sub-stop, uh, subtypes of, of COVID-19 uh, patients have been identified. Uh, and we have to answer all the questions. Uh, remind, uh, remember that not all SARS-CoV-2 is the same, not all hosts are the same, not all host responses are the same, and we need to find out what is the meaningful COVID-19 subtypes in COVID-19 associated RDS. The treatment modalities, uh, they are exactly the same as we use in uh, RDS. Here's a picture from Journal of Applied Physiology. We need to follow the common RDS protocols, but what we have to remember is the important difference, uh, the endotheliopathy, which means that it is uh, endothelial disease more than a alveolar disease. And also remember that we can uh, diminish the vasoplegia by using prone position uh, and positive, uh, positive end expiratory pressure or CPAP in those patients. So we need to use the common protocols as we uh, used to do. And as the last comment is that further research is needed because there's a lot of, uh, we need to find a lot of pieces to have the right puzzles for what is COVID-19 and uh, what is the difference in, in different in our heterogeneous population in the intensive care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bodel. And with that, I think we'll just move straight on uh, to Kathy again. Uh, Kathy is also the director of a very productive clinical trials unit. So please tell us more about the remap cap study. Thank you, sorry. Uh, yes, remap cap. So um, we all remember the uh, swine flu pandemic uh, that hit us about almost uh, just over a decade ago. And very recently, uh, now Professor Sir Peter Horby of the recovery trial pulled together our sort of uh, our output, shall we call it, from that pandemic. And what you can see here, I want you to look at the bar, or should I say the absence of a bar on the right hand side. So actual patient enrollment and results published during the pandemic in an interventional study, so a randomized study, gets a big zero. So we clearly had a problem that we didn't do any learning through the H1N1 pandemic to help our clinical colleagues know how to treat H1N1. So just after that, planning for the remap cap trial commenced. So it commenced in 2011. It was really from the failure in the H1M1 pandemic that the thoughts came about about having something interpandemic that could be ramped up for the pandemic. Remap stands for randomized, embedded, multifactorial, adaptive platform. And we've heard a little bit about adaptive platforms from the uh, solidarity speaker. Uh, another wonderful platform uh, trial. So the first funding came from the European community and uh, as part of a platform for European prepared preparedness against re-emerging epidemics. And the actual idea of this was to generate evidence that could be applied to clinical practice during a pandemic. It was like a sort of hold, put some a trial in a holding pattern, ready to kind of uh, open up for the pandemic. So it re commenced recruiting during the interpandemic period uh, in community acquired pneumonia, and then was pre-designed to adapt when the pandemic came along. And then the pandemic came along and remap cap pretty much morphed into remap COVID. Remap cap continued, but actually community acquired pneumonia was less seen and COVID was more seen, particularly in the UK as I've shown you. Uh, we changed uh, eligibility, so we adapted eligibility from admission to an intensive care unit, because in some countries like my own, uh, people weren't getting into the intensive care unit, so it was really adapted to an eligibility criteria of receipt of organ support, i.e. critical care-like, so critical care surge areas could also recruit. 
primary outcome, which was mortality at 90 days, which is a good patient-centered robust outcome for something like community-acquired pneumonia, but too far away if you want to get answers during a pandemic. So it was uh, adapted to days alive and free from organ support at 21 days, deliberately trying to bring the outcome in and closer to the patient event so that evidence could be generated around interventions. So it already existed on the left-hand side. The way that platform trials work is the core protocol. DSA stands for Domain Specific Appendix. And a domain is essentially a collection of interventions in the same therapeutic area. And you add the domain specific appendices to the core protocol and get each one approved as it sort of comes along. So there were a number of domain specific appendices already going for community acquired pneumonia in the non-pandemic uh, severe ICU population. A few of them morphed like antivirals into the pandemic. There was a pandemic appendix to the core protocol and then a number of domain specific appendices approved throughout the pandemic, starting with severe ICU patients, but actually moving some of them into the more moderate COVID-19 patients on the ward. What were the domains? I'll just sort of take you through the domains rather than all the interventions. But you can see here as early as January 2020, the corticosteroid and antiviral ones are the ones that morphed from CAP to COVID. And then there were new ones added, immune modulation, immunoglobulin, therapeutic anticoagulation, statins, vitamin C, antiplatelet one, immune modulation, an update, uh, ACE2, RAS and uh, antiviral. And the nice thing about a platform trial is uh, essentially what you're doing is randomizing patients to a sort of a regimen rather than an individual intervention. So you have a patient with COVID-19 suspected or proven, and then uh, essentially they are eligible for certain domains and not other domains. Now, eligibility might be that a particular hospital is not actually taking part in the immune modulation domain. So hospitals can flex as to which domains they decided to adopt. And then obviously you have to have at least two options within a domain for it to be randomized. But as you can see, a patient is randomized to interventions in domains uh, across the domains that are available in that hospital and the patient's eligible for. And essentially the patient ends up on a regimen, which is a, a combination of what they've been eligible and randomized to. This is a, a Bayesian trial, but uh, it's sort of uh, at one level, that's just a statistical approach. But the way it works is essentially patients are enrolled, they're randomized, the outcomes are recorded, and that was that shorter outcome. Essentially, the trial data is updated. The statistical model that underpins the whole Bayesian trial is updated. And you have uh, pre hoc, i.e. pre-agreed efficacy or futility sort of rules and if a uh, intervention in comparisons meets the futility, it stopped. If it meets the uh, efficacy, it graduates and adds to the interventions that are of value to clinical colleagues in treating the disease. And if it doesn't, it continues, but the randomization uh, weighting is updated. So if it's looking good, but hasn't met the stopping rule for efficacy, more patients in the, in the randomized response adaptive randomization, more patients might be randomized. The weighting might increase from one to one, say to 1.5 to one, with more patients going into the uh, interventions that are looking more promising. Uh, results, uh, you'll know all these. Uh, so the recovery trial results for dexamethasone forced the uh, corticosteroid domain to close and, and publish. Uh, there was a, in the antiviral one, there was a hydroxychloroquine stop in the UK for the safety issues or concerns around hydroxychloroquine. And also later in the year, lipinavir and ritonavir were found to be, meet the futility criteria. You'll be aware of tocilizumab and sarilumab uh, in the immune modulation and the publications. Uh, convalescent plasma recently indicated to uh, be futile. Uh, therapeutic coagulation uh, for critical care patients, futile, but some sense for ward-based patients, uh, there was sort of uh, efficacy uh, and it was few, uh, superior to control. So uh, sort of a suite of results coming out. All other domains, that statin, vitamin C, et cetera, those are all still ongoing. 
The other thing that's interesting is it's across the world. So you can see here it's grown globally. And most recently, we've had the pleasure of inviting in Critical Care Asia, uh, and they're now recruiting actively into the trial. It also has a whole suite of global funders that keep the platform running uh, so that the evaluation of these different interventions within the domains in Remap Cap can continue. The other thing that's really good about a platform trial is, as you can see here, whether you look at total patients on the left hand side or COVID-19 patients in the middle, you get more randomizations per patient. So it's like many trials all happening within the platform. So you're sort of generating more information because a patient will be uh, randomized to that regimen and you can make all those comparisons both between interventions and interventions with control. The other thing that's good about being global is obviously we've been the big hitters for a while in UK with all the COVID-19 cases. Ours are now reducing, although I did say earlier, they do seem to be rising again. And you can see Asia, uh, the cases, as we well know, all those terrible sort of scenes from India and the like, uh, the cases rising there. And so it allows us to continue to evaluate therapies uh, for COVID-19. UK, we did a really good job and, and, and certainly uh, the other speaker referred to the recovery trial. I just thought I'd reflect on why we were able to recruit 45% of the global sites and why we were able to recruit 65% of the global uh, patients randomised with COVID-19. And I think it's unique to the infrastructure in the UK for research. And I'll just take you through these things as a, as a thought piece. So we have a very strong critical care network. So we have units collecting data, active sort of professional trainee networks, all research folk. Uh, and more importantly, we have experienced research nurses who are sort of working locally. And I'll come on to that in a minute. We also had a concept of urgent public health studies. So you can see here that three trials were identified as our national priority. The principal trial, the recovery trial and remap cap. And here you can see we got our Kathy, urgent public two health minutes badging. left. Cat, but all hospitals must take part, and you can see the rise in site numbers following Kathy, that. Two Big minutes tat. left. Thank you. Drug supply. This was done centrally, so there was a real can-do attitude with uh, those who are usually supplying drugs to uh, the health service, also picking up the research needs uh, for drug supply. Uh, regulatory, we have a single national system, approvals for applications were days rather than months. Uh, and we saw the contrast to the UK to our global collaborators who had much harder times getting the appendices approved. Mainly, we have this clinical research network from our National Institute of Health Research. And this actually provides resources, people and money to local sites to deliver research. And I think because that existed, we were able to throw in another study pause all the non-COVID studies and deliver very, very quickly, also building on a high degree of communication. Clinical trial, just quickly, uh, we engaged a clinical team. We had a very simple recruiting and randomize. We had a single consent process for recruitment to those multiple domains, and we minimized data collection through the use of routine data. We had very rapid and very responsive oversight with very hard working oversight committees. And we also had, because of our pause research and a clinical trials unit, we were able to rapidly expand the trial management team and use, as you might imagine, virtual training, virtual documents, that kind of type of thing. And pragmatic monitoring, realizing that we couldn't go into hospitals. Lessons learned, I think the UK critical care and research infrastructure has been vital. Platform trials, like the other speaker, have delivered rigorous and rapid results. Increased global collaboration has led to delivery of rapid generalizable results, but it's a complex way of working. Embedding in clinical practice and data enabling of trials is important for efficient design. And I would just say, having done 30 years of research in the UK, it's amazing what can be achieved with a universal can-do attitude. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. I think a truly inspiring talk. Um, I suspect most of the people listening to to this webinar share the um, 
the, the, commitment the commitment to make sure, to make sure that more of our patients, of our patients can actually be can actually included be... in clinical trials to advance our field. Um, so thank you for, for those experiences from the UK. Next up, we have a, a bit of shift. Uh, we'll, I'm introducing a colleague, another colleague from Oslo University Hospital, uh, Sernago Usbak, and uh, he'll be giving us some insights into the experiences from the pre-hospital management of COVID-19. Um, and thank you for the invitation. I'm going to, uh, to have some pre-hospital comments. Um, uh, and I'm going to, to share some of our experiences uh, from the moderate waves from Norwegian shores and send all my regards to the colleagues facing much harder waves and weather uh, other places like in Sweden. Uh, I'm going to say something about the pre-hospital management of COVID-19. Uh, our first frontier is the emergency medical control center. Uh, and uh, at least in our capital area, they faced um, initial breakdown in the primary care. They had to uh, control limited resources uh, and identify a new enemy, uh, this silent hypoxemia patient, uh, and they needed to have different tools to, to, to get the right patients and, and uh, get the resources to the right patients. And the tools were uh, monitoring of, uh, of uh, saturation. Uh, they introduced video consultations uh, to be able to see the patients. Uh, they introduced a uh, consultant anesthesiologist um, at duty, uh, helping uh, triaging the patients. I think our colleagues uh, helped and saved several lives of patients they never saw. Quite impressive. Uh, this was also a coordination hub for us, um, uh, taking care of uh, the old moving targets to, to isolation, uh, exposure routines, uh, PPE, and etc. Very important. Uh, um, a Swedish study also addresses this uh, and uh, evaluating some of those um, uh, pre-hospital uh, identification tools. Uh, our colleagues in the ambulance departments had quite a tough job during, the, especially the first wave. Um, in uh, the capital area of Norway, uh, we've had the, this biggest wave. Um, uh, they had an impressive training program. Uh, they uh, had uh, a mass delivery of personal protec protection equipment, PPE. Uh, focusing on decontamination, uh, and on the top of the wave, 25% of all the missions were COVID-19 suspected or confirmed, putting quite a lot of burden on uh, the staff and on the delivery systems of equipment. They had, let's say, 500 missions a week, uh, a day, for instance. So that's quite a lot of equipment. Our doctors were only facing some of the most severely uh, affected patients, uh, but they did take part in the training, uh, in the helping with the triage and in the new treatment protocols, like the CPAP, optimized oxygen delivery to the patients, introducing prone positions even for awake patients. Uh, and I would like to highlight some of my younger colleagues, uh, like uh, Wille Mottestad and Jens Ottomellen on those pictures, uh, really taking responsibility for sharing information. Uh, this is just a minor part of their production uh, in the first wave. Uh, case reports, uh, uh, training programs for the ambulance departments, um, uh, uh, public media uh, interventions, and they even had a National Geographic article uh, addressing uh, the identification of the hypoxemic COVID-19 patient. That's quite impressive. I think that was very important in the in to get people to understand what was hitting. Uh, we also had some uh, more experienced colleagues. Uh, uh, in this picture, you see 65 years of pre-hospital experience, uh, but they faced a new enemy. Uh, and inspired by an acute, severely hypoxemic patient, they designed a mobile unit of uh, inhaled NO delivery systems to try to, uh, to cope with this extreme hypoxemia. They also started the RSD trial approved for, for, for this. Uh, some of those lessons learned. Um, uh, I think I would just highlight the, the last uh, topic uh, on that, li that list, uh, and that is that the use of PPE in the pre-hospital environment is quite difficult, and it's even harder than, uh, than in, uh, in uh, the in-hospital environment that we're used to as well. Uh, I would focus on some parts of the inter-hospital transfers as well. This was our weather forecast. Uh, we've been discussing that a bit uh, already. Uh, we were warned that uh, we were facing quite high waves hitting our shores. Uh, maybe some 500 ventilator patients, maybe a thousand. Um, 
Uh, those were the actual numbers, fortunately. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't face those big waves that uh, we were warned about in the in the weather reports. Uh, but uh, some parts of the country had a cluster attack, uh, especially in the main parts of Norway and uh, in the in the um, uh, Oslo area. Uh, and as you can see uh, on this map, uh, uh, the distribution in uh, the different parts of the city as well was cluster attacking. Uh, so some of the, our hospitals had quite a tough job. Other hospitals didn't meet this wave at all. Um, and previously, previously mentioned, uh, they had the survival rates of uh, the Norwegian ICU patients. Um, and they conclude that the Norwegian hospitals have operated within capacity during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would like to look a bit more into this. Um, these are some of our numbers for inter-hospital transfers in the same period. Uh, in Norway, in total, we have uh, something like about 120 ICU transports. Uh, this uh, follows the waves, the different waves at the, the different periods throughout the country. Uh, and I think that was an important part of how we could cope uh, with this pandemic. Uh, we discussed several uh, other medical uh, magic bullets that didn't prove uh, to be uh, of any value. But I think the ability to transfer patients to, uh, to uh, have sufficient ICU capacity, that's a major part of how we could cope with this. Uh, our regional ICU capacity was on the edge this spring, uh, and we had to, to do like in, in the, the UK, uh, to planning for maybe a longer transportations, but uh, then um, the tide turned. Uh, we had a leader uh, trying to, uh, to address this as well, uh, but the tide turned and we just had to, to, uh, to do um, transfers in, in our well, region of several hundred kilometers. But I think we have some lessons learned. Uh, we have a lot of uh, help from the checklist, procedures, safety officer uh, and the teamwork, key features. Um, we also in Norway saw uh, uh, diversity, both specialized teams uh, and like in our area, uh, focus on uh, just educating people with volume and flexibility to, to prepare for the next wave. Uh, we had this epi shuttle that you've been seeing on several pictures, and where we have more traditional solutions for transporting the patients. But uh, anyway, this is time consuming. Um, uh, and we see that uh, stuff with earlier ICU transfer skills that's e easily customized. This is no magic stuff. It's possible to do, but they have to be trained. Uh, and I think uh, the medevac solutions is very important for the fighting spirit, both for the whole population and for people, especially at the smaller hospitals. Uh, so I'm very happy that in Norway we were able to uh, establish several transportation platforms to meet those needs. Uh, this is the population distribution of Norway. The main part of the population living in the bigger cities in the, in the south, uh, but also a small population uh, living around everywhere. Uh, and that's why I'm very happy that we were able to transport those patients. This is from our local ICU transfer capacity here in Norway. That was copied to uh, several of the other hospitals around the southern part of Norway, covering 90% of the population. But I'm really impressed about uh, uh, our colleagues in the north uh, performing uh, fixed wing operations from Bode or helicopter operations from, from Tromsø. Uh, and our colleagues in, uh, in uh, the Hemsar um, um, from the Royal Norwegian Air Force uh, being able to, uh, to give these uh, this, uh, solutions to every, everywhere. Uh, we also made a medevac option with several patients, as you can see. Uh, and I would just like to, uh, to end by uh, discussing preparedness and resilience. Uh, these are pictures from uh, one of our colleagues uh, returning from uh, an Ebola incident. Uh, we had uh, former exposure with SARS, swine flu, Ebola, influenza, etc. And we had this national response team. Uh, and that was very important for our response, just to build on that. Uh, we had many uh, information sharing platforms, free access of articles, but case reports, well, uh, documents, everything was really easily shared between the previous workers. That was very important. That became a wave in the end as well. Uh, I would like to look to Finland because we had a lack of preparedness and personal protection equipment in Norway. Uh, our first 10 uh, ICU transfers were with 10 different variations of PPE due to lack of equipment. And a fun fact, uh, our protection suits borrowed from food production in the first part. Uh, we had some research follow-ups, 
we have the infrastructure, they established our ability to start fishing for data and do data collections from the very beginning. That was very impressive, and I hope that's going to be for big concern for, uh, for uh, our next major event. Uh, I just want to say uh, we have to focus on the lessons learned. This platform today is very important, but I think we have a lot of co-workers everywhere that has their stories, their solutions, and we should really search for all those key features in the future. Um, in my last slide, I just want to, to say uh, we have this today a, a very common anesthesiology and IC platform. I think that's very important. I think we should share the pre and in hospital experience. Uh, I think uh, that's very important. We are used to chaotic situations. We have this superpower to be so problem solvers. Uh, hopefully, uh, the system has less holes after this pandemic. But I think we should search for the holes and try to mend it. Uh, and with joint forces, pre and in hospital, we are a strong contribution for future resilience in the healthcare systems. Thank you. Thank you, Sven Aare, for taking us out of the hospital. Uh, we are moving on. The next speaker is uh, Francois Lamontagne uh, from uh, Quebec in uh, Canada. He is an intensivist and has been involved in extremely many uh, randomized controlled trials. And uh, he is also uh, uh, a chair for a number of guidelines and therapeutics for COVID-19 pandemic. So his uh, task today is to uh, tell us how to make those guidelines for COVID-19. François, the floor is yours. Thank you um, very much. I'm going to share a screen and uh, hope for the best. Okay, thanks. Wonderful. So it's a, it's a true uh, honor and pleasure to, um, to be with you today. Thank you for this wonderful invitation. I uh, uh, hope to uh, uh, eventually attend uh, such a wonderful meeting in person in the not too distant future. Um, I have one disclosure that I, I'd like to mention. It, it, I, was, um, I was presented this way, so just know that I, I have been involved um, with uh, uh, recent guidelines led by the WHO, uh, but other part of my work is to uh, conduct research. So I am a member of the uh, REMAPCAP collaboration and um, lead uh, separate studies evaluating um, such things like uh, vitamin C for sepsis, but I try to keep those two roles distinct and manage um, potential intellectual uh, conflicts of interest uh, accordingly. So, um, I, so I was invited to present about you know creating guidelines during the pandemic, but um, my initial inclination was to say that there isn't you know really anything special about guidelines during a pandemic. Pretty much everything. I, I would be inclined to say about evidence-based medicine and guidelines applies within the pandemic, during the pandemic, but also before and after the pandemic. Um, in reality, this work, this line of work has a little bit of a, uh, a bad reputation because we end up quite commonly uh, in, the, in the position where we have to tell enthusiastic early adopters that perhaps the the, the, the data isn't that convincing and that we need more research. Uh, we have to explain fairly frequently that there are, in effect, in you know, healthcare, quite a few clearly effective interventions. Uh, fortunately, not many clearly ineffective interventions because we, we get rid of those. But a lot of what we do, a very large part of what we do is somewhere in this gray middle zone where there is data, uh, it's just not entirely convincing. And what is special about the pandemic, having you know, thought about this in, in preparation for this meeting a bit more, is that we are normally collectively, as clinicians, and, and uh, which I am, quite tolerant of this uncertainty, quite happy to operate in this gray zone. Uh, if anything happened during this pandemic that was a bit special, is that we raised the bar a little bit and um, uh, quickly, collectively decided that this degree of uh, uncertainty was perhaps not acceptable. The UN uh, published documents 
um, acknowledging the fact that the problem during this pandemic would not be a dearth of evidence, would not be a lack of evidence, but it would be an excess of perhaps conflicting, uh, unreliable data. And the challenge would be making sense of it all in a timely fashion. Something they called in English, I'm sorry for this French uh, a screen capture, but something they called an infodemic. Um, and so this is how rather efficiently, I think, uh, we went from having early evidence that steroids are harmful to rather convincing evidence suggesting that they probably reduce the risk of death and, you know, going the other way around uh, for something like hydroxychloroquine. So I think that is somewhat impressive. I think uh, there are definitely lessons to be learned, and I think this would apply after the pandemic as well. So I'm, I'm going to take these next few minutes to, exp I'm not sure why this happened the way it happened during the pandemic, but I'll share some thoughts about, you know, why perhaps uh, it happened. I think this came about because there was a bit of a reunion uh, between um, uh, methodological input. There was perhaps more uh, credit or value or legitimacy uh, uh, afforded to, to methodological input. Um, but there was also a new, very key, very central stakeholder um, involved in, in you know, with the WHO. And I think that this new stakeholder was extremely proactive and, and played an important role in centrally coordinating this effort and making sure um, uh, to keep this, this work uh, globally relevant. So I'm going to explain what I mean by that. In a way, you know, the 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 recipe for um, trustworthy guidelines has been, you know, drafted uh, has been around for a while. It's not like we we did anything uh, new here. Um, this isn't. It's not like pure mathematical science. Uh, this process, this recipe, doesn't guarantee um, that you will, um, you know be certain uh, about anything this is about managing uncertainty it's a it's a it's a process born out of a long experience of trials and errors and many resolutions that we would not make the same mistakes over and over again and it's 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 really just a process that in the face of uncertainty increases the likelihood that we will get it right um, but but this isn't new and and all these these bullets here, all these criteria for trustworthy guidelines uh, were there before the pandemic. Uh, the first ones that I bolded here are, are you know, sort of methodologically heavy. We, we know we need trials and studies. We know we need syntheses. We know we need rigorous critical appraisal of, uh, of the evidence. And we need to distinguish the, the uh, you know, the making of the drafting of a uh, recommendation, its strength and its direction. So we sort of know how to do all this, and we knew before the pandemic. But for some reason, uh, you know, although we learn not to trust entirely uh, in in observational data to evaluate uh, therapeutic interventions, um, we somehow we 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 remain normally quite tolerant of this. We we know that uh, we shouldn't trust too much in surrogate endpoints because in some instances, a drug can quite effectively reduce your risk of um, cardiac arrhythmia after a myocardial infarct, but it still increases the risk of dying. Uh, some drugs are quite effective at reducing the risk of a GI bleed, but they do other bad things to you. And anyway, so we, we've learned not to be too reliant upon these surrogate outcomes. But, you know, just consider how much uh, starches we administered to our patients before Anders and you guys taught us to do better. Think of how long we, we used the high frequency oscillatory ventilation before we were convinced um, that it perhaps wasn't the best thing. Uh, we are still day in, day out, quite comfortable to do a number of things, um, even though there isn't huge evidence supporting what we're doing. Um, and, but during the pandemic, this hasn't been the case. Um, we, we stuck to the plan, we stuck to these principles, and there was a rather proactive uh, consensus 
uh, to say that all of these gray marbles had to become either a little bit whiter or a little bit darker. We, we needed to reduce that uncertainty. So take, for example, the case for, for steroids. A year ago, just a little bit over a year ago, we had evidence uh, about you know, the potential effects of steroids in COVID. There were two studies, um, observational studies from China, and they both suggested that steroids increased the risk of death. Now, that, that was not a lot of data, and so quite a few people were keen to look to the evidence uh, on steroids for influenza. There was more data there, still observational studies, and they were relatively consistent, and they too suggested that steroids increased the risk of death. Now, for some reason, in 2021, we still don't know what steroids do to patients who suffer, who have influenza, and who come to the ICU. For some reason, even though influenza is a recurring problem, yearly we get those waves of influenza, we treat them in the ICU, we still rely on observational evidence. But for some reason, again, during the pandemic, this wasn't enough. And good, good on us and good on, on, on the recovery team and other trialists that uh, we pushed through and, and, and had trials, you know, completed trials uh, that were then synthesized and that informed uh, what I think are, are, are reasonable um, uh, clinical guidelines. We also know that small numbers are a problem. Um, this is a classic uh, example. This is often uh, discussed or taught. This is a, 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 a trial of more intense chemotherapy for kids who have leuke uh, leukemia compared to a less intense chemotherapy regimen. And during the course of this trial, the data monitoring committee examined a number of interim analyses and early on was tempted to stop because the evidence looked so good right? Rather convincing. And remember, continuing a trial means that you continue to expose patients to the other intervention that doesn't look so good. But fortunately, they kept on going and, and this early apparent benefit disappeared. And, uh, and so, so we learned that, you know, sometimes you, when, when, when results are based on just a small number of events, they are just the result of coincidence. But uh, and this, this we, we stuck to this principle during the pandemic. Uh, this is not a guideline I was involved in. This was uh, chaired by friends and, and colleagues of mine. But <clears throat> in, in the face of, you know, very uh, seemingly positive data on ivermectin, the panel <clears throat> um, uh, convened by the WHO looked at the evidence and said, even though this looks impressive, for all sorts of reasons, you know, a small number of events and other issues, it's just still in that gray zone. So you'll notice that the panel didn't say ivermectin doesn't work. The panel concluded that it was, they recommended not to use it routinely uh, outside of a trial, meaning if this is a priority, it should be studied well. So we stuck to our guns in a way uh, and put this like contrast this to what we're doing day in and day out in the ICU. It's just, typically quite hard to explain that what we're doing isn't really evidence-based uh, before a large trial comes out. We tend to be quite reactive. When the big trial comes out suggesting that starches are harmful, then we say, yeah, you know, that's, that's what the evidence says. But until the big trial comes out, it's like we're not calling it like it is. Uh, we're, I like ECMO. I like to do ECMO. I'm paid a lot of money to do ECMO, but is is this uh, rather intense therapy, uh, you know, completely supported by uh, um, you know irrefutable evidence? Probably not. But it's difficult to say that when you're on the ground in the middle of uh, of, of you know uh, clinical activities. So for some reason during the pandemic there was more legitimacy uh, in saying that the data is not convincing. And, and that was, I think, a bit of a game changer. This isn't to say that <clears throat> methodological input gets it right all the time. Uh, sometimes you're faced with a situation that uh, you've faced in the past and there's a process, right? You know, there's a process and, and we sort of know how to deal with potential subgroup effects, how to evaluate them and their credibility. But in other situations, we have to 
uh, react to a situation that wasn't experienced before. But at the very least, this systematic methodological assessment allows you to transparently explain the process that led to one evaluation or another. So if people disagree, they can at least know on which ground they disagree. Now, why did this change during the pandemic is not entirely clear, but I think a lot of it has to do with uh, uh, the WHO playing a key role in coordinating this effort. These other criteria for trustworthy guidelines require the type of clout that only the WHO has. Uh, the WHO has to take into consideration every patient on this planet. And so this is a different perspective from the perspective of professional societies that have a, perhaps a narrower view of the trade-offs between benefits and risks of interventions that, that we like to, to practice. So <clears throat> the other thing that the WHO did is that it was able, given its, its role, uh, to access data much more efficiently than, than usually. Uh, for guidelines to be relevant, they have to be timely. They have to be done efficiently. And between March, when the pandemic was announced, and uh, um, it only took uh, a few months to complete not just one, but a number of trials, access data that would normally not have been accessible. So data sharing, which you know, uh, trialists are sometimes reluctant to do, happened uh, this time around, thanks to the WHO leadership. Two high quality uh, knowledge syntheses were completed. The panel was convened, uh, guidelines were drafted, peer reviewed, and everything was published you know, just a few months later. This is world record breaking speed. And it only became faster and faster as we developed more and more experience with this process. Now, the WHO having done this once was keen to do it again. And the other very important role it played is because it, it started planning for these guidelines is that it prioritized them. And it prioritized guidelines, taking into consideration, again, a, a more global perspective, global relevance. And what I mean here is that for the first time in my experience, the triggers for these, for, for these guidelines wasn't the publication of potentially practice-changing evidence. I mean, certainly when someone publishes something in the New England that is practice-changing, that is a good incentive to create a guideline. But when there is pressure in certain countries to administer a medication without good evidence, when you're in this gray zone, that also became a good reason for the WHO to trigger a guideline, ivermectin, for example, and hydroxychloroquine. So this is a game changer, and we'll perhaps talk about it more a little bit later during the panel discussion. But I think, personally, it is important to do guidelines when there is practice-changing evidence. But it is at least as important to uh, come out with reliable guidelines when the data isn't convincing, because that is the only way that you generate consensus around the need for better evidence and uh, uh, evidence-based practices. So something definitely happened during the pandemic, and I don't think that we wanted to change when the pandemic is over. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francois. I think that was an excellent conclusion to this session uh, on research and treatment modalities. Uh, and you will be joining us for our last section in the panel debate. We're looking forward to that. In the meantime, uh, we're shifting gears a bit again. Um, I will be introducing um, uh, Christina Bondios. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist and researcher at the Norwegian Center for Violence and Traumatic Stress Studies. And she'll be talking on the subject that I think some of you have already brought up. Uh, how, how have the healthcare workers fared during this pandemic? Go ahead. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's exciting. Thank you for having me. So as mentioned, my name is uh, Kristina Bundesch. I currently work at the Norwegian Center for Violence and Traumatic Stress Studies here in uh, Oslo. Uh, where me and my colleagues are currently conducting a study on the psychological impact over time of the COVID-19 pandemic on hospital personnel in Norway. Uh, you can see on the slide that we have a good company with four participating hospitals. And you can also see who our funding partners are to which we owe much gratitude. 
so in this talk, I will try to briefly give you an update on the current state of the art regarding the psychological impact on healthcare workers of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is something that has been brought up or touched upon by several of, of the previous speakers. And I will also show you some preliminary, not yet published data from our Norwegian study. As a brief background, I believe I am preaching to the choir when I say that healthcare workers play a key role in managing pandemics. While doing so, healthcare workers face numerous challenges, such as an increased workload, uncontrollable and sometimes frightening work situations, they might have to make difficult ethical decisions and they expose themselves to risk for their own health, both physically and psychologically. Stress, feeling a lack of control and the experience of adverse events are all risk factors for developing psychological problems. And we also know that having psychological problems or, or um, a lower functioning than normally psychological might influence work performance. Uh, and thus, the well-being of healthcare workers, like yourself, are essential to maintain a high quality of care. But how big is this problem? Well, uh, as also have been mentioned previously, there are some inherent difficulties in doing studies during a pandemic. Uh, and especially when you're trying to look at the people who are working the hardest at these times. Uh, but what you see on this slide is results from a meta-analysis that have used pooled data from 86 studies conducted both during COVID-19, but also from previous pandemics. And they indicate that there is substantial heterogeneity in prevalence rates of various psychological problems across studies and thus across populations. And what you see on this slide is the mean prevalence rate and confidence interval for various psychological issues. And overall, it appears that what could be described as a quite rational worry about your own and your family's health is very prevalent, as are these general indicators of psychological problems such as insomnia and perceived stress. Elevated levels, symptom levels of post-traumatic stress disorder, depression and anxiety and somatization are less common, but they are still clearly at elevated levels with prevalence rates between 15 and 30%. And as another example, this figure comes from a systematic review examining studies on the psychological impact of working only during COVID-19, ex excluding previous pandemics, uh, and examining the psychological impact on healthcare workers up until May 2020. Results here also indicate great heterogeneity between populations, but suggest that symptoms of anxiety and depression are prevalent in slightly over 20% of healthcare workers, that almost 40% have sleeping difficulties, and almost 30% experience distress. And these two examples are relatively consistent with other studies that have emerged during this pandemic. And to conclude, what we see is that overall, Almost one in five healthcare workers report symptoms of depression, anxiety, and stress, and two in five report the experience of sleeping difficulties and general worries. So what are the risk factors and protective factors for developing psychological problems? Well, what appears to emerge from data is that working closely to COVID-19 patients, such as being frontline, working in the ICU, working at pandemic hospitals, or reporting seeing more patients who are infected with COVID-19, are associated with an increased risk of psychological problems. So is reporting more work days, not having sufficient time and possibility to recover after work. We also see that nurses have a higher risk than medical doctors of developing symptoms of anxiety, depression and PTSD. But we see that levels of general stress and burnout appears to be equivalent between professions. Living alone, uh, which could be an indication of having lower social support, appears as a risk factor. And so does being a woman uh, who have a higher risk than men and younger age or fewer years of work experience. Resilience factor that are protective against the development of psychological problems appears to be the use of adaptive coping strategies, such as exercising, practicing mindfulness or planning ahead. Uh, people who report that they have received sufficient training in various medical procedures necessary to, to take care of patients 
uh, also have, have lower stress levels. We see that social support from family and loved ones, but also from supervisors and colleagues uh, are protective factors. And on an organizational level, we see that working in a structured unit with people who you are familiar with and people who report uh, higher levels of perceived safety at work are at lower risk of developing problems. Uh, so is knowing one's immune status and having information on common stress reactions and way to manage those, so how to handle your own stress reactions. So what can we do to mitigate this risk and increase resilience to, to uh, um, enable healthcare workers to recover more quickly? So what you see on this slide are the recommendations from the World Health Organization. Uh, on how to how to mitigate the the mental health impact on healthcare workers, and summarized, these recommendations highlight the need to ensure good working conditions and enable healthcare workers to focus on their clinical work and patient care, rather than on, for example, administration. It also highlights the importance of having an open and allowing workplace culture to facilitate both the seeking of collegial support, but also to facilitate or lower the threshold of reporting potential issues with patient safety. Uh, it also states that individuals who need additional help should be provided with access to such services, and that can be both psychiatric services aimed at reducing psychiatric illness, but also services of a more psychosocial or counselling nature, including advice on how to maintain a work-life balance. The evidence level for specific interventions are very limited, mostly due to a lack of data and a lack of randomised controlled trials. But there are studies examining the acceptability and effect of both person-directed interventions and organization-directed interventions. There is some support for various person-directed interventions in leading to a low symptom reduction, but overall results seem to indicate that organization-directed interventions have a greater effect on stress levels and symptoms of burnout. And such interventions could be, for example, reducing workload and rotating shifts, implementing mentoring programs, training leaders in providing support for their staff, ensuring that staff has adequate training so that they feel prepared, and also making sure that the daily needs of workers are met. So moving on to the preliminary data from our study here in Norway. In this study, we are collecting data from participants working at four Norwegian hospitals, who you see on this slide here. The overarching aims of the study is to get a knowledge on healthcare workers' experiences during the pandemic, what consequences these experiences have for health and work performance, and on what measures that might secure that hospital personnel can work with continued good health during large-scale crisis. So, of course, partly during the corona COVID-19 pandemic, but also uh, in future emergency situations. Data for this study has been collected in three waves, following the waves of the pandemic in Norway. So the first instance took place in April 2020, and the second in uh, December 2020, and the third just recently in April 2021. So what have we found so far? And please bear in mind that this is preliminary data. It's not yet published, and so it hasn't been exposed to peer review. Um, but what we see is that around 20% of our participants report weekly headaches and almost 20% report increased stress levels and tiredness. And although these numbers are somewhat lower than the international data previously described, it is still one in five who experience psychological problems. We also see that working with COVID-19 patients is associated with higher levels of all these outcomes, and participants working with COVID-19 patients also reported more unpredictable work situations, higher workload, more negative experience using personal protective gear, and feeling more unsafe at work compared to participants who had not been working with patients. And I see that I'm running out of town, so I'm going to skip ahead a bit. Um, to my last slide, I think, because as a final remark, what I would like to stress is that managing the psychological impacts uh, that working in a pandemic has on healthcare workers requires organizational effort and cannot be solved on an individual level. 
If one in five personnel experience reduced psychological health, this indicates that there is a structural problem. And a workforce in good health is essential to maintain a high quality of care. And thus putting measures into place to ease the psychological burden of staff should be high priority. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christina. We are now moving uh, into the last uh, session, which is called Learned Lessons from this Pandemic to Better Be Prepared for the Next. And um, we have uh, four speakers, Anders Tegnell, Espen rostrup Naksa, François Lamontagne, uh, Sten, and Sten Rubertson. And first one out is uh, Dr. Tegnell, who is the state epidemiologist of Sweden, the deputy director and heart of the Department of Public Health reporting at the Public Health Agency. Uh, he is a specialist in infectious diseases, has a PhD in infectious diseases and a master in epidemiology from London School of Hygiene and Epidemiology. He has worked with preparedness for health threats in different settings since early 2000 and was also part of the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1995. So, uh, Anders Tegnell, uh, the floor is yours. As I said, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, I think it's especially very interesting, nice to be here because anesthesiology and intensive care has been such a critical part of the management of, of this uh, pandemic in many ways. Uh, so your experiences and, and what you have learned from this, of course, very valuable for our future preparedness. Uh, just a few words about the public health agency in Sweden, just to show that we work in a, in a very wide context normally. We are one of the expert agencies under the Minister of Health and Social Affairs in Sweden. And, and as an agency in Sweden, uh, we have a very wide mandate and also broad responsibility, uh, much broader responsibilities than agencies in, in many other countries, both when it comes to uh, what we actually decide and can do in ourselves, uh, what we can regulate and what we cannot regulate, but also uh, that we have a very wide responsibility for a number of different uh, parts of public health. And we need to remember that this pandemic has hit us not only uh, with the patients ending up with you in intensive care, but it really affected people in many, many ways and in ways that we're probably going to have to deal with for a long time into the future. And I think that's one of the lessons learned that we can discuss a bit later on. Uh, we are of course, also very much working with our uh, mandate with communicable disease prevention. Uh, we are the focal point for IHR, uh, the connection to WHO, where we do a lot of interaction with uh, our fellow institute in, in other countries all over the world. And that co collaboration has been incredibly important. Um, we also coordinate the, the Swedish regions who, who do most of the work, uh, both in, in health and in prevention. Uh, and we are the coordinating agency in Sweden for that. Uh, and we do collect data, of course, on COVID-19, but also on a number of other diseases. And we are the uh, national reference lab uh, for a number of rare diseases and also coordinating the labs in Sweden. Um, so what do we do in communal disease control and preparedness uh, at the agency? Uh, what we do right now, which is very much in, the, in focus is infection control, and healthcare was associated infections. So we are one of a, a number of different agencies in Sweden, and uh, not least the regions working with keeping the health staff as safe as possible. Uh, we of, of course also do antimicrobial resistance like many do. And mainly we do a lot of surveillance uh, in many different ways. Uh, not least during this period, we had very good collaboration with the uh, Register, quality register in Sweden that exists for intensive care patients. And that's been a very important part of the surveillance that we can do. 
we of course currently work a lot with vaccinations so that's one of the main things we do right now uh, but we have also a storage of certain medicines in place if there should be a need for that which hasn't been the case during this pandemic but in previous ones and we do a lot of coordination with country with similar agencies in other countries um, we have a lot of preparedness in place of course uh, we have people at working 24 hours 7 uh, taking care of different issues lab issues epidemiology issues and many other so we have a duty officer on, on call uh, all the time um, we have a lab capacity to do, to test for different infections 24 also 24 7 uh, we also have communication staff on, on call all the time and uh, work with our pandemic plans of course so this is something we do all the time, even if the pandemic is, of course, much bigger than what we usually do. Um, just one slide on the regulatory context in Sweden, because that's different in, in, in different countries, and you need to understand that when you talk about what measures you can put in place. Uh, there is some legal framework in Sweden, but not to the extent that, that there exists in other countries who, who, for example, have put a, a complete formal legal lockdown in place. Uh, that legal framework does not exist in Sweden at this stage. Uh, we share responsibility between the three different levels of uh, organization in Sweden, both the municipalities, running schools, elderly centers and many other things. The regions who run the county medical officers and run the health care in Sweden. And uh, we of course work very close with the National Board of Health and Welfare in Sweden, who are more involved in actual health care issues. So what happened in Sweden? We had a massive introduction in Sweden uh, during the winter holidays, uh, which takes place in February and in March in Sweden. Uh, One million, 10% of the Swedish population leave the country during those days. And at this stage, there was a huge spread of the disease in many European countries. So many people came back with the disease from all over. Uh, we could break the transmission chains from one of the, some of the known hotspots, the Italian Alps, to a certain extent, the Austrian Alps, but they came Sweden. They came also Swedes back from many other places, and those were not always recognized. And in the end, we had a widespread of the disease in Sweden, and it was not possible to stop the disease at the borders anymore. Um, after that, the development in Sweden was, as you can see here, fairly similar to what happened in many other countries. You can see the Swedish curve with a number of cases in bold, uh, where the other are dotted lines. And uh, as you can see, Sweden is somewhere in the middle when we compare ourselves to, to a number of other countries in Europe. Uh, we know well that our Scandinavian neighbor, neighbors have, are the ones that are the outliers in the systems. They are, to a great extent, spared, uh, especially Norway and Finland, but also to a certain extent, Denmark. Uh, but Sweden has experienced a pandemic that's a lot more <coughs> similar to uh, what other countries in, in the EU has had. And we are now down at fairly low levels and the, the curve is now decreasing rapidly in Sweden. And we see fewer cases being admitted to hospitals and, and, the, and the number of cases in hospitals are also dropping quickly now uh, due to the season and probably also <coughs> due to a very successful vaccination program. So what we have tried to do is to minimize more mortality and mobility, uh, now very much with the vaccines, but also with other measures earlier on. Uh, we have focused maybe a bit more than other uh, countries on minimizing negative consequences for individuals or society when it not comes to uh, COVID-19. We have been trying to have more tailored measures and interventions, not closing down the whole society instead putting restrictions on restaurants, on, on big gatherings and so on. So in many ways, we have had a virtual lockdown in place, even if it has not been a legal lockdown like in many other countries. So what have we learned? Uh, our, the international collaboration, I think, can be improved. It has been very good in some ways, but I think that uh, we really need to go back and look at how we can help each other even more and share data even better than we did this time. Uh, we need to understand that flexibility is the key here. Uh, every pandemic has given us different problems and different uh, things that we need to solve. 
and we need not only to prepare for another pandemic like this one, but for a completely different one next time. Uh, we need to be better and quicker at setting priorities in emergencies to understand what we're actually doing. We're putting a lot of uh, measures in place uh, to see the wide spectrum of the effects of those. So COVID-19 has been complicated for all of us, not least for you. Um, the next pandemic will certainly be different in what way we don't know. Uh, we always need to see the broad public health uh, consequences when we discuss the pandemic. Uh, every pandemic has had those, not least this one. Um, this has been a stress test for many parts of the Swedish society, and we're definitely going to work on the things that were exposed. And uh, last but not least, unfortunately, this has increased inequalities in health in Sweden and probably in many other countries. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Anders Tegnell. And uh, we move on to the next speakers now, and then we have the panel discussion afterwards. So the next speaker is uh, Espen Rostrup Noxta, uh, who is a specialist in internal medicine and respiratory medicine. And uh, his main areas have been uh, mechanical ventilation, cardiac arrest, and also um, uh, other areas to uh, uh, protect the society against uh, all sorts of uh, threats. So, Anders, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so, the topic of uh, my very, very brief talk for eight minutes will be uh, learned lessons from this pandemic to better uh, to be better prepared for the next one. And um, it's a tricky question, of course. And uh, uh, as you all know, it's been more than 100 years since we had a really huge severe pandemic last time. And this picture is from, from Texas, uh, Fort Riley in Texas. And these are actual soldiers on their way over to France to fight during the First World War. And they, of course, brought with them uh, quite a few cases of uh, Spanish flu, which later, I think it was 2005, was uh, actually identified as uh, influenza type A. So it took almost 100 years before uh, anyone knew what this disease was all about. Now, luckily, we have learned a few things from other epidemics and also pandemics. And uh, for my part, I learned quite a lot from uh, the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Uh, not only because we had employees at the Norwegian CBRN Center who were actually in West Africa, but we also had a patient from West Africa uh, who was brought home, a medical doctor with Ebola. And this led us to focus more on how to handle highly infectious disease patients, uh, both outside hospital and inside hospital. Now, um, the interesting part, I think, is how things have developed since the millennium, since the uh, around 2000, when it comes to outbreaks of emerging and re-emerging infections. And the pattern is quite clear. Uh, we have more outbreaks of uh, diseases that have a potential not only to be epidemics, but also to, to develop into a pandemic. And of course, the question mark is what is next on the line? And uh, now we know that it was the coronavirus, uh, which is, of course, not the only coronavirus we have in the past years, but, uh, but a new SARS virus. And then one could ask, what lessons uh, have we learned from the initial phase of this pandemic? was very tricky and under so slides about how this hit very differently in different countries. And um, this slide is from the 8th of March 2020 and I had my first webinar lecture on this topic in Norway. And um, at this time point, 144 countries had cases of SARS coronavirus, uh, the number two registered. And um, also in the earlier stages of March 2020, we knew that the transmission rate was reported to be somewhere about two to three. We had reports of, of the case fatality rates being in the range of 2% um, of registered cases. And we knew that the incubation period was somewhere between two and 14 days with some outliers, of course. Um, and um, we also uh, learned some lessons from Wuhan, I would say, and how uh, this outbreak was handled. 
and not least because uh, during the entire pandemic, uh, less than 1% of the population in Wuhan, which counts 10 million people, have been registered with COVID-19. So in spite of that, uh, they really needed to build hospitals and new barracks overnight, uh, basically, uh, to handle the influx of patients. And this indicates uh, a more severe problem than seasonal, seasonal influenza and other uh, common infectious diseases. And I think this was an early warning that, uh, that this was tricky to handle for, for the healthcare system. Uh, going back to the 8th of March 2020, um, Norway and Sweden were among the first countries to actually have their registered cases. And Norway was even number five on the list uh, of cases per capita, uh, which shows that uh, after France and, sorry, after Italy and maybe Spain, uh, we were one of the first countries that were actually hit by this first wave. And um, <clears throat> what we knew then, as of early March, was that most cases, more than 95% of the registered cases, had uh, were cases of mild symptoms, and most patients improved after one week and were fully recovered uh, after three weeks. However, we did know from the cases reported in Wuhan that uh, somewhere between uh, one and five percent of the cases uh, developed mild mild symptoms and eventually going into a critical condition in the ICU, and then most of them died uh, around week number three. And compared to seasonal influenza, uh, this disease definitely had a higher admission rate and a high, higher case fatality rate. And the relationship between patients in hospital and the ones actually needing ICU treatment were about one to five, meaning that one out of five patients needed ICU treatment. And the majority of those in ICU needed mechanical ventilation of some sort. And the tricky parts were, uh, the, around hypoxemia, RDS, blood clotting, etc. were also reported in March of 2020. So there was quite a lot to learn in the initial phase regarding ICU capacity, uh, staff, staff and systems, not at least PPE. And the way many countries or many um, uh, physicians have thought about pandemics is that you need large spaces, like in the picture from uh, Texas, large spaces to sort of stockpile people with the same condition and give them some IV lines and some oxygen, and then everything is fine. What we learned from this pandemic is that these are really ICU patients. They're critically ill, and uh, we need more isolation and ICU capacity to, to handle pandemics. That's that for sure. Um, we learned a lot from Italy, and we had a webinar, as I mentioned, on the 8th of March, and all these slides I show now are from <laughs> the 8th of March, 2020, uh, and not at least... Uh, 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 Graselli, Dr. Graselli, gave us very much input uh, from uh, Milan on how uh, they dealt with the first cases of February and March. So then one can ask, how did this influence, this knowledge that we had, how this, did it influence our crisis management in Norway? And to us, it was, it was quite, quite clear that this was, of course, epidemiology, but it was also health crisis management and, to a large extent, also the society crisis management. So every sector in the society was affected, and basically every inhabitant was uh, affected also by this pandemic. So our strategy was to involve all the key stakeholders, not only the research institutes, um, but also the universities, the university hospitals, uh, and also the, region, the regional and local health authorities, and try to adopt some simple principles for crisis management. And these principles, um, at a glance, look... Uh, very simple. And uh, uh, we usually think of it as a timeline. We have an outbreak of a disease or another incident. And then eventually, when everything is over, you have either a worst case or a best case uh, result in terms of consequences. And of course, in the initial phase, you don't know where you will end up. Uh, and uh, as time goes by, you will actually see more clearly what the actual consequences of this pandemic will be. And our rules of thumb, at least my rules of thumb, <laughs> when working on this, uh, are quite simple. There are five rules. And the, one, the first one is, of course, as early as possible to consider the potential consequences, the best and the worst case scenario uh, in this pandemic. And now when we have more knowledge, we could say that maybe New Zealand maybe is the best case uh, uh, situation, and maybe India so far, uh, right now at least, uh, 
is among the worst the affected countries. Then number two is, of course, to establish a joint and correct situation awareness. Uh, things like what is the reproduction number? Uh, what is actually the admission rate? Uh, what is the case fatality rate for this disease? And what other consequences are foreseeable in this pandemic? Really important to establish a correct uh, and joint uh, awareness or um, a description of the situation as early as possible, of course. And then comes the tricky part, uh, and that is to establish a goal for a goal for the crisis management. Uh, where do we want to aim uh, uh, in the scenario between the worst and the best case? And our decision in Norway was to hammer down the virus, uh, to lessen the burden on the healthcare system, on the individuals, and also on the society, until we adopted more knowledge and knew more about a possible exit strategy uh, from this pandemic. So. Um, that was our strategy that led, led to a complete lockdown uh, a bit later on. And then, of course, once uh, a correct situation awareness is established and uh, we have set a goal, then the question is, how can we reach this goal? And in Norway, there was an emphasis on the individual efforts, how people could contribute. Uh, and they, they were told how to contribute and they really wanted to contribute. And we also, of course, had the regulations, we had the uh, laws and also programs for awareness raising, not at least for minorities, uh, to, to sort of have everyone work in the same direction to reach this goal. And then, of course, the fifth rule of thumb is to reconsider and revise strategies uh, on a regular basis, because new knowledge de is developed, and uh, the uncertainty is huge in the initial phase, and as time goes by, uh, we know more, and then we need to adapt everything. So the development in Norway was like this. Uh, in early March, we had our first uh, cases um, that were not traced back to Wuhan or to uh, Italy or to Austria. And that's when things started to get really hectic. Um, and um, on the 12th of March, we had started a six-week lockdown. Um, and on the 1st of April, our daily cases peaked at around 565. And um, at that time point, we had accumulated, we had almost 5,000 uh, positive cases registered, uh, which was actually a bit more than Sweden at the time point, uh, and more than most of the countries in Europe. So we really had a tough first wave. But our research institute, the Public Health Institute, has calculated that the actual number was probably somewhere around 50,000 uh, during the first uh, three weeks. So there were quite a few uh, people um, uh, falling ill. And the highest numbers in hospitals in terms of patients were during the first weeks of March in 2020. Then, after this lockdown, we ended up with almost no cases whatsoever for three months. We had less than 10 daily cases during the summer. And in mid-July, we had only three patients in hospital in Norway with COVID-19. Um, and this is the graph of uh, hospital admissions in the different regions. The yellow is the Oslo region. And you can see that the third wave that we had now in February, March of this year was actually a bit higher than the first, but in total for the country as a whole, uh, the first wave uh, was the heaviest burden on the healthcare system. These uh, are the same figures for mechanical ventilation. And the registered cases of COVID-19 and the admission and ICU data are almost parallel. Uh, there is a one week uh, gap between the increase in uh, in uh, positive cases and the admissions in hospital, and uh, that's sort of helped us analyze this. So uh, finally, lessons learned, uh, at least to manage a nationwide lockdown is very tricky. It's not popular and it has a lot of consequences, of course, but our approach was to, to be honest and transparent when communicating both what we knew and what we did not know, and also uh, to have a public debate on any issue, really to be there and discuss both rules and regulations and other topics, everything from aerosol transmission to uh, use of face masks, everything has been debated uh, in Norway, um, in media and elsewhere. I think one of the key factors that, may, that actually helped us was the development of a testing isolation tracing quarantine system that we use, um, still use to a large extent. 120,000 people are safe tested every week in Norway. And then we developed a five level risk of response system, I think quite similar to Sweden, where we sort of um, place the risks uh, in every community, every city, uh, based on five levels. Uh, and of course, the outbreak management has been local. We have adopted local regulations to the extent possible. 
so that um, the strict regulations actually are in place only when and where needed. So uh, I think that was eight, eight minutes, at least for an introduction. Thank you, Espen. That was exactly eight Norwegian minutes. Um, so we will then uh, go back to François Lamontagne uh, that we have presented earlier, and he will uh, give us the Cana Canadian point of view on uh, the lessons learned. Thank you. I hope to be sharing the right screen. Uh, can you confirm that you're seeing the uh, right mode of presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I mean, I have uh, just three slides here. I, I didn't prepare a very long presentation. This echoes to some extent what I said in the previous uh, discussion, uh, but but focusing on, on um, I guess, learned lessons here and um, seeing a question or two questions in the chat uh, that we might continue to discuss uh, in a few minutes. Um, so three lessons, in my view, not necessarily a Canadian perspective, perhaps rather uh, this has to do with guidelines and, and, and evidence um, uh, to guide practice during the pandemic. So first lesson, which is something I, I underscored during the first presentation, is to me the, 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 the challenge is not the lack of evidence. It's that very early on, uh, you need to recognize that you will be dealing with too much evidence. Uh, conflicting evidence and very, very strongly held opinions. So this is a knowledge transfer challenge. You need to communicate and convey how evidence-based you know, medicine works. You need to explain that there will be strongly held opinions and there's a difference between expert opinion by a scientist and the scientific approach, which is to uh, consider and appraise all of the available evidence. So that is definitely a challenge. I think that needs to be recognized early on, at the beginning of a pandemic, at the beginning of a crisis, but as I pointed out earlier, this is always important, and I think we can learn to do it better even after the pandemic. So recognizing this and then communicating it, uh, mobilizing stakeholders around this notion uh, that there is uncertainty is, is, is definitely important. Second lesson, uh, and this might echo a little, to some extent what Kathy uh, said um, uh, earlier during this meeting. I, I'm a big, big fan of platform trials. And as I disclosed earlier, I'm a member of the, the Remap Cap Collaborative, so, so I'm a supporter. But I think that if you look at the, the, the you know, world records that were set during this pandemic, so the speed that, at which you know, trials were launched and I mean, certainly having a platform trial ready approved that that did have an impact that is a, a novel you know like a novel design and there's 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 something new and exciting about this but i think the real uh like the, most of the 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 uh, what explains this really rapid pr progress during the pandemic it's not the hard infrastructure. It's not the technical technological advances. It's the soft infrastructure. It's for you know to to to, to explain what happened. It's you really have to understand that people agreed to share unpublished data. Journals accepted to publish studies that were terminated early. Um, uh, uh, people around the world agreed to collaborate and share in the same study rather than, you know, lead their own uh, smaller projects separately to some extent. This is always true, but, but this happened during the pandemic. So this is what I call soft infrastructure. This was basically a number of people, more people than usually, agreeing to collaborate. That is what I, I mean in terms of soft infrastructure. This explains why there were platform trials all over, but it is in the UK where this, this coordination, this discussion, this, this acceptance that research had to be part of a health system had taken place earlier, this is where the bulk of the recruitment occurred. So this is this consensus had been achieved earlier. And I think that is the, 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 the cornerstone uh, and the agreement to share and collaborate. So I think, I think the soft infrastructure is, is crucial, perhaps more than the technological and design uh, advances. And then the last bit is, again, something I pointed out earlier, is that it, it's this admission that uh, it is not 
only important to disseminate a praise and you know push these you know uh, findings that that a, a, a drug can 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 change something it's also the recognition that you need the same kind of rigor and systematic critical appraisal for everything that you're doing perhaps even more so when what you're doing isn't 100% established as as scientific so there was a, a comment in the chat saying you know isn't it equally important to do this for supportive care measures for sedation for you know the way you ventilate a patient for fluids for like definitely and this is where not only i think we need to develop the soft infrastructure part we we learned that this worked now we need to do what the uk did elsewhere we need to start doing what worked for new drugs or you know effective drugs for everything else from diagnostic tests to public health interventions to supportive care therapies and so i think this admission that we are day in day out practicing in the midst of a fair bit of uncertainty and that this is we, we should collectively agree that this is somewhat intolerable and that we need to generate evidence about most of what we do is is also quite important uh and that's it those are the main lessons learned and uh, happy to, to continue the discussion uh, uh with you guys um the last speaker is uh, stan rubertson he is a professor of anesthesiology and intensive care medicine at Uppsala university hospital and during the pandemic he has had a role in the emergency committee at the uh, hälsostyrelsen uh looking at uh how to how things have been during the pandemic and then we will get his input from that point of view stan floor thank you very much can you hear me can you see me see yes me don't that doesn't matter so much but you can at least hear me well i am going to give you my um, experience though subjective um, as a clinician but mainly as a staff expert in intensive care medicine within the crisis organization established uh, within the National Board of Health and Welfare. Uh, at time zero, at Genesis, when it all started, the, the healthcare system was already stretched. Um, as Professor Chu already told you, we have a very limited uh, ICU beds. Uh, we have uh, only about five ICU beds per 100,000 inhabitants, and they are not evenly spread over the country either. So it's, um, it's one of the lowest in Europe. So that was uh, how it was from the beginning. I start again then that the healthcare system was already stretched and uh, we had only five ICU beds per 100,000 inhabitants. So very limited access to intensive care medicine. And the other thing, we don't have any national ambulance service uh, for transportation, uh, either by ambulance or air. So it's all spread all over the country. And uh, the thing was also that um, we didn't have any emergency stocks uh, available because in the end of uh, the 1900s and or beginning of 2000, we had a good taste to just shut down everything of this. And uh, we instead started to trust just in time principle uh, which meaning that we had maybe only two to four weeks of consumables and drugs within the hospitals, which were um, really affected us actually. And um, I must admit that some weeks, some days we had, we didn't know if we were going to have enough propofol for the next day to sedate our patients, which was really bad. The other thing was that who was going to take the lead? Well, in some countries, you know who took the lead, but in, in Sweden, I think it was a rather good collaboration between the politicians and the experts. However, we had a lot of self-appointed experts that was uh, out there in the press that I think disturbed the, um, the community a lot with their opinions uh, back and forth. Uh, we had a health emergency pre preparedness response plan uh, that um, was organized for crisis. However, we were uh, those were organized maybe for um, the, the Russians coming to trying to take Sweden in a war or something like that, but not maybe 
at best adjusted for the uh, for a pandemic. So there were some key players, and that was the National Board of Health and Welfare, the Socialstyrelsen, the Public Health Agency uh, uh, of Sweden, where Anders uh, is working. And we had also a third uh, governmental agency, the Swedish Civil Contingency Agency. Um, and I must admit that I think the collaboration from the beginning was a little bit scarce, and it wasn't uh, so efficient. However, during the course of this pandemic, I think this uh, uh, collaboration between the, uh, we, between the agencies have uh, substantially improved. Then we had a four player and we still have, and that's the, uh, that is not an authority or a, a agency. It's uh, actually a member and employer organization, the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions, Sveriges Kommuner och Regioner, SKR. And they took on a, a rather, uh, I mean, dominating uh, 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 position in this. So I think there was some uh, collaboration problems from the beginning between uh, uh, agencies and also SKR, but that has also uh, evolved and improved over time. What evolved was that it was a crisis organization within the National Board of Health and Welfare. And that's where I have been involved. Um, from start, it was only seven people that was involved in this organization. And rapidly, the number of people coming into the National Board of Health and Welfare was enormous. I was amongst one of them. I came in in the end of a March, beginning of April. And in May 2020, it was already 135 people. And it was a mix of military. Uh, they uh, really were worked hard for the infrastructure uh, communication part, which I think was excellent. Uh, the own staff of, of uh, the National Board of Health, Health and Welfare and some outside experts, me pointed out as being one of them. Over the, the time being, now it, it's only about 50 people that are working within this uh, organization only. Uh, I still think it's a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit too big at times. And the crisis organization was uh, organized into an illustration group. Uh, we got a lot of information from all the different datas and um, uh, data banks, and uh, they helped out with visualization and informa of inf of inf information into graphs and tables and things like that. There, was an, there is an analysis group where I belong to that um, are doing daily or weekly analysis of the situation. Uh, and these analyses are very much based upon available data from the Swedish Intensive Care Registry, which has been absolutely in instrumental. We're getting also a lot of uh, good information from the Public Health Agency of Sweden, ECD, DC, uh, and also publications and reports in medical journals that is ongoing and also from the WHO. There is a support group because uh, there is some consumables, but also a uh, stock of medical devices, for example, ventilators that are holding by the uh, uh, social students. And for sure, there is a purchase department, which is excellent because we had, uh, I never been able to order things in the amounts that you have, uh, that has been a possibility during the crisis uh, uh, of the pandemic. The government has really opened the, the wallet. And there is a press and crisis communication uh, group also, which is, has been very good to take care of the press and media. The most important thing that I think evolved over the, the time was the, the ICU coordinating network. And that was uh, started up by the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions, but supported by the National Board of Health and Welfare. At this uh, coordinating work net network, there is um, representatives from all, for, from all 21 regions in Sweden um, have their ICU representatives. We have daily meetings, 
but now it's down to three times per week. Per week. And to these um, uh, meetings, we get updated statistics from the Swedish Intensive Care Registry. And um, to be able to coordinate ICU beds on a national level and uh, to plan for transportation of ICU beds patients so we can spread out the burden of taking care of these patients. Uh, and I think it's been, it's been working very well. And without this organization, I think we have been in a big problems. So for the future then, what kind of lessons have we learned? Well, there are several reports ongoing and many more are, are to come, but many things are also obvious. Uh, personally, I would like to see a more slim organization. And I must say that I miss uh, medical experts within the National Board of Health and Welfare. Uh, I'm not alone, but there are not too many of them. I'm alone as an ICU physician. I have, we have, we have a few um, uh, others, but um, I think it, it could be good to have a little bit more of medical experts within this organization. Um, I think it's very important to have a clear le leadership coordinating not only ICU beds because there are also other areas within the national, national health care system, like cardiothoracic, neurosurgery, and cancer surgery that has to be um, coordinated to ensure equal availability uh, of health uh, care. And that has been one of the downsides because we have really um, prioritized the patients suffering from COVID, which means that, and also that was shown by Professor Chu, that other uh, patient categories has been downgraded for some time. And we have a, 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 a big depth to take care of these patients now. And for sure, I must say that emergency stocks need to be rebuilt. Uh, it cannot be so that we have only stocks for a couple of weeks within the hospitals. We, and it has to be a, a, at least something that lasts for three to six months. Also, I mean, Sweden has been a, um, a country where we had, a, a, where we still have a lot of pharmacy industry. And I've been thinking a lot about that. We probably need to discuss national production of certain consumables and vital drugs. That could be a Scandinavian task to take on because when we have a pandemic, it's not too easy to, for small countries like Sweden to be prioritized when the big dragons like United States, etc., cetera, uh, have a, also a need of drugs. Uh, so it has been a little bit of a fight uh, internationally who's going to get this, this, the supplies. So I think that has to be uh, at least um, further evolved. And I do really think, think that we need more ICU beds and ICU nurses. I would rather like to see it's being organized like a fire station a little bit too many there at daytime they um, met, uh, that can uh, prepare uh, for, for the worst. And when the crisis comes, there will be enough beds and enough uh, nurses and also physicians to take care of these patients. And there is a lot of other things to come that we, we, we uh, definitely need to um, uh, take care of for the future. This is my views. It's very objective. I'm sorry for the hassle from the beginning with the pictures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sten. A couple of questions in the chat uh, from Jon Henrik Lake to Anders Tegnell. Um, have you been able to assess what impact hospital strain may have had on non-COVID mortality and morbidity? Okay. Um, not in any detail so far, as far as I know, but maybe one of my colleagues knows more. We know for sure that the waiting times for certain elective procedures has been increased. Uh, and we also know for sure that certain uh, screening programs have not really, like, cancer screening programs have not really been uh, done as well as before 
So there is definitely what we in Swedish call a mountain of care that needs to be taken care of. I know the National Board of Health has made some kind of efforts to estimate how big it is, but I don't think there has been any figures out yet. But there is definitely a lot to do now when COVID-19 is diminishing. Thank you. That's another one from Jon Henrik Loke, this time to Espen Naxta. Uh, as we have heard, our Danish colleagues quickly established national guidelines for the management of COVID-19. Why did the Norwegian authorities resist uh, both a formal endorsement of international guidelines and development of our own? Well, to my knowledge, uh, it was not resisted at all, but uh, the... the uh, hospital regions did not ask for it and they did not take the initiative and uh, this has been a debate uh, even in the media uh, why and why not this was not done um, so I don't more I don't have any in-depth uh, information about it out of that but I want to just place one very quick comment to Stan Robertson which I think is very correct that we need more ICU beds because in a pandemic the pandemic patients add to all the other patients we have in the ICU so, so we need that extra capacity. The problem with exponential growth of, uh, in a pandemic situation is that it doesn't matter if you have double or triple the amount of ICU beds because they will only last 10 days anyhow if you can't stop the exponential growth. So you need both more beds, but you can't solve every problem uh, by having triple or quadruple uh, capacity, in my opinion. So you need to do something with the influx of patients as well, of course. You want me to comment that or? <laughs> no, I, I think it makes common sense because no country has managed this, but but, uh, but you have done well, very well and you have tripled the capacity, but still uh, when you have exponential growth, it's really hard to solve the problem only by ICU capacity. But that's my point. We need other measures as well. No, I agree, but uh, I would rather also see that we, we could have a better Scandinavian um, uh, collaboration uh, we um, that for sure would have been needed uh, I, I could have seen that but it, it's very difficult we are individual countries and it's it's uh, tricky to 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 but I think we should at least maybe discuss for future um, when we have it's gonna come more pandemics I'm sure hopefully not without with it with uh, without it's not gonna come so soon but I think it would be great if we could co collaborate more over this topic and see what we can do. But I mean, for example, and being so stretched as Sweden was from the beginning, it's, it's not a good starting point. It's not a good starting point. Uh, Anders Tegnell, you mentioned during your um, lecture that uh, uh, the other uh, Scandinavian countries were spared and that uh, Sweden is more like a regular uh, European country. From your point of view, why was what's the reasons for Norway and Denmark and others to be spared? I, I think that's an excellent question, and I don't think we have a really good answer to that. There is, of course, differences in in. Uh, the introduction introductory phase i don't think we really can compare how many people there were in the phase because how many you find in your statistics depends on how many you test and we definitely did not test even a small proportion of all the sick people during the because we had such a big problem with increasing our lab capacity so the swedish figures from the very beginning are far too low uh, they were much much higher than this i think that's one aspect uh, and then Population density varies between the countries. Uh, what our population looks like varies also. So there, there are differences. Uh, I think the, to me, maybe the biggest mystery is, is why did Finland and, and uh, Norway uh, have so few cases in spite of not putting in place so many measures. There are many countries down in, in continental Europe had a lot more severe lockdowns than we had in, in Scandinavia and still suffered a lot more uh, than we did. Uh, but I think this is what we're going to spend the next few years trying to figure out. And I'm not sure we're ever going to find an easy, at least not an easy answer, because there's so many things playing into this.
Uh, yeah, the, if you raise a hand, you can also uh, uh, come with questions uh, from the audience. I can jump in with a yeah, question. Sure. Yeah. So I think to uh, whoever wants to answer it, I think uh, with the capacity challenges that maybe many of us have started out with even before the pandemic, uh, and then obviously making um, uh, stretching stretching our capacities and and uh, um, uh, sort of uh, making do with what we have, kind of feeling that we might have lowered our standards on on some accounts. How do we now make sure that we're not accepting a new lower standard of treatment uh, moving forward? Espen. Well, I hope no one really wants to lower the standards uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic, of course. I think we will be back on track in every country at some time point. Uh, but it's, of course, it's tricky now because uh, there, is, um, there is still a lot to do. There are patients who have waited for months or even years in some countries. So it will take time to sort of uh, get all the heads above water and, and, and be back on track when it comes to, to, um, to ICU capacity and to have a more, uh, more normal population of ICU patients than we have had in this pandemic, of course. So um, but it's a very good question. And I think, I think most countries, even Norway now, will really reconsider the need for ICU beds and, and to have, as Stan said, a bit more beds than you actually need uh, as a preparedness measure uh, is uh, is probably feasible in, in most countries. I think, uh, can I uh, fill sure. in a little bit? Go ahead. I, I think, you know, it's very important uh, question that you're taking up uh, or an issue. I mean, because we definitely have seen that a lot of other patients have suffered because they had to be on the waiting list for so long now. So I, at least in Sweden, I would like to see a more, as I said also in the end, a better organized uh, health care for all kinds of patients, not only for the ICU. I think we, we are 21 regions in Sweden. I must admit I'm not a fan club of that. I, I, uh, it, everybody can do a little bit um, work independently on, on, on issues. I would like to see a better coordination of uh, not only ICU intensive care, but also at, at other patients, because otherwise we will have uh, problems in, in quality of healthcare um, after this pandemic. Uh, there's a comment uh, on what Anders Stegnell said about Finland uh, from Matti Enkinen. Uh, disagree with that measures in Finland were very strict, including closing the borders between Helsinki region and the rest of the country. I think if, if I can add something to that uh, point, I think um, when you look at countries in the world and, and how they came down from the first wave, I think that sort of answers a lot because um, when you have a really low incidence, like we, we had in Norway during the summer of last year, then it doesn't really matter how much people meet. Uh, you you won't have any outbreaks anyway, anyhow. So, um, but um, many countries had strict lockdowns, and especially in the UK, for instance, for for weeks and even months. But um, they probably reopened too soon before the numbers came down enough, uh, and then they just peaked again after a few weeks. And I think that's at least um, that's a lesson learned that um, if you impose. Lockdown measures, you need to do it early and you need to, to, um, to see effective results and to get the numbers down before you go back. I think at least that's how we have interpreted uh, how many countries have done that when we uh, look at Europe and the United States. And that. So I think there was also a question on guidelines. Um, for, uh, and... Um, regarding uh, potential concerns that that maybe any treatment or anything we try to implement uh, across various systems that are very different and then seem to treat maybe different patients or maybe have different uh, quality of care. Um, how confident can we be that that we can make one global guideline that will that will fit us all or how, how vulnerable how, how big a problem is it that our outcomes are so different? 
So, uh, or well, so I, I try to answer in, in writing. This this might be um, it's an interesting and and it could be a longer discussion. But the uh, clearly the issue of variable um, standards uh, that is a bit of a that is a problem. Uh, but you know and and studies and the, you don't solve inequity uh, across uh, poorer and richer societies uh, with with a guideline, right? Uh, uh, that it's a bit of a there, there's a, it's a loaded question and there's a, a separate part to this but the the simple variation of uh, baseline mortality before you give a treatment whether that influences the guideline and 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 the utility of a guideline requires that you distinguish a, 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 you know between relative effects and absolute effects so a first step is trying to figure out whether there is good reason to believe that the drug the therapy would work in one country and not in the next. And if if you can't like objectively be confident that there is a difference in relative effect, then there will always be differences in absolute mortality between different places and in the same place over time. But that will only influence the absolute effect you expect from a drug. So the number needed to treat and so forth. And then, then this is no longer a data question. This is a values and preference, values and preference judgment call. So the panel has to determine whether the overall benefit is large enough to offset all of the disadvantages of a drug. And when, when it does, then that's one of the reasons to make a strong recommendation. Given a drug that has benefit, but a lot of downsides, huge costs, adverse effects, then, then different values and preferences may impact the recommendation. If a, a, a you have a lower absolute effect from a drug, that might be enough to determine you know, stopping to use a drug, but that would typically impact the strength of the recommendation. So the process we follow sort of takes this under consideration and, and it, it should be encompassed in the decision-making regarding the strength and the direction of the, of the recommendation. Okay, thanks. And, and I think perhaps following up on that, um, another question, um, I think perhaps asking for for some insights and thoughts about uh, how to use um, infrastructure and platform trials moving forwards. What are your thoughts uh, on progressing that? It, uh, me, uh, you're asking. Well, my so that that's platform trials. You know, that um, embedded data extraction. These are all. Uh, Things that that potentially uh, are helpful uh, that uh, probably merit you know being continued and better integrated. But as I pointed out earlier, I think the the name of the game, the the cornerstone, is less the type of design, the gadget. The it's really a consensus. It's about collectively deciding, uh, recognizing that we can't tolerate uncertainty and that we need to encompass this you know learning healthcare model we need to make learning part of standard care uh, it's uh, four o'clock and uh, we are ending uh, this uh, session uh, thanking uh, all uh, the speakers and uh, all those that uh, came with some uh, questions in the chat and uh, i want to uh, remind you to go into the ssai2027.com page and register for the next uh, uh, for the next conference uh, 8th to 10th of June 2016 and then at the end um, i was going to share a screen but i was disabled by the host here so see if it works out no it doesn't work. Well, uh, that uh, was uh, it. Uh, we ended with a little bit of uh, complications. We had some complications underway, but we have come through all the speakers and we have ended up uh, in time. And now I get the permission to co-host. And let's see if I can uh, do that quite quickly here. Oh, was many. This is, oh. <laughs> so.
So we're ending like we started with. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you can see it now, it works. This is an SSAI postdoc grant. So just uh, take a picture of it and uh, you can then uh, apply for that duration of two years with a 50% clinical postdoctoral research position. So uh, by that, thank you everybody and uh, have a nice afternoon and evening. Thank you.